I'm in search of conversation guests. If you are interested or know someone that might be interested, please contact me directly. Thank you. So you uh, did the the tr uh, track scholarship, got to Stanford, uh, anthropology, and then you said what was anthropology? Environmental was, science and policy. What was the other one? So two different. It's like environmental Environment. science and policy was focused on um, kind of how you study environmental science and how it applies to law and um, and government policy, and focused on specifically on mm -hmm. the ocean, kind of ocean policy. And then the uh, anthropology stuff is, what? you know, study of mankind and, and humans. And I did a, an archaeological uh, trip down to Peru for a summer and got uh, got to be involved in an excavation of a 2,000-year-old pre-Incan site that was actually a cult uh, way up in the mountains of the Cordillera Blanca in Peru. So this is like, this is the summer after my freshman year. And professor that was oh, one of the goodness. anthropology professors who was like, hey, we need some volunteers, you know, you just got to come out and dig in the ground for a few months. Um, and then I'll pay for everything else. You know, you get your plane ticket and accommodations paid for. So I was like, sweet, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in. So Lima and then oh, you know, yeah. took this uh, bus up to the middle of nowhere, little tiny town way, way up. It was at like, I want to say like 12,000 feet up in the mountains. So really high up in the, in the Andes mountains. And uh, we got up there and it was this site that was partway excavated um, and it was a cult where they would bring in people from all over the region to pay tribute to this cult. And what they would do is they'd bring, um, they'd bring like uh, shells and other presents up to, um, to this cult. They would present them and then they go through this indoctrination ceremony where the cult leader would basically give them peyote and they would... Um, put them in these underground tunnels and they'd be like tripping and, you know, hallucinating and walking through these underground tunnels. They would uh, have water that would run through these passages and make a really loud noise, like a thundering noise. And they'd get to the end of the passageway and there would be this idol um, rep uh, representing the cult. And they'd use these coal mirrors to, um, to shine light down on it and like, you know, highlight this idol and they would see it and they'd fall down and they'd be like, wow, this is amazing. And that was kind of like part of their indoctrination ceremony. So this is 2000 years ago and we were there digging in the ground. Uh, this is in uh, 2000 and uh, 2001, I guess, summer. And uh, we were down there and, and pulling up uh, stuff out of the ground. And when I was there, the summer I was there, we pulled out these shell trumpets. So this is 12,000 feet up in the mountains. They have these conch shells that were carved with these intricate carvings that were brought as tribute to this cult. And we were, you know, we digging in the ground, we pull these things out and like the head archeologist would looked around, pull this trumpet, uh, this uh, shell trumpet out of the ground and is looking around saying, hey, does anybody know how to play the trumpet? And I, I played in like a ska band in high school, right? So it's like, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we were in the nineties, uh, our, our generation was right, exactly. music, right? yeah, not a punk at, at West Hill. You know, we had a trumpet and saxophone. Yes. And so, you know, who knew that that skill would totally translate? You know, I, I would get to use it later. So, so this guy, you know, he hands me, uh, <laughs> Professor John Rick hands me the, the trumpet, and I get to actually play this 2,000-year-old trumpet, you know, around. And oh, now it's in, goodness. like, the, you know, National Museum of Peru or whatever. And I mean, it was a big deal that we found these things. I think in that season we found... I remember maybe 15 of them all with different designs and it was, it was really cool. I mean, it's like Indiana Jones, you know, walking along and they have these passageways underground that nobody had entered for, for thousands and thousands or for 2000 years. And, uh, you know, you get to be the first person to go down there and, and check things out. It's pretty special. Dang. That that's me at 19. Uh, I went to, well, I went to a computer college uh, luckily got a job at IBM, but I was doing like small time, like, like entry level work, I guess, but it was at IBM. Um, gosh, your story sound like that sounds pretty freaking amazing. Did you have prior to that? Have you been out, out of the country? So you said at 19, you did right. that in Peru? Yeah. yeah I, grew up, I mean, I traveled like have, 
a little bit like, you know, we go down to Mexico. My family went down to Baja a lot. Um, we went, I took a trip in high school. I did the Europe trip. Uh, well, we went to uh, Spain for the Spanish class so I, on that trip and mm -hmm. went around a little bit to France and Germany just to, since I was in the neighborhood. But no, I didn't travel a whole bunch. And I think that's why when I got this opportunity in college and, and then especially took that first summer trip down to Peru, it was like, this is amazing. Like, I need to keep doing this. I need to figure out a way to keep going overseas. And so every summer after that, I went wow. somewhere else. I went, you know, New Zealand was the next summer. Australian, uh, let's see, the next summer after that, I went to India and Australia. Um, yeah, it's just every summer I was going out and doing some kind of research. I went to the Bahamas one time and uh, worked with fishermen on marine protected areas. It was just, I got the bug. And then, you know, I did a job after I... I finished college in 2005. I worked in California on environmental issues um, for the next four years or so. And then um, my wife got this opportunity to become a foreign service officer. And so we moved to Vietnam and uh, she joined the State Department in 20, uh, 2009. And then we moved to Vietnam in, to Ho Chi Minh City in 2010. And, uh, and since then we've just been overseas basically. We go back maybe for a year of training but uh, for the most part, we're always overseas, always going to a new country. 2010, I was in uh, in Saigon in, uh, gosh, 2009. I don't think I was, I, I think, I think I was out of, I was back in the States by 2010. So I probably missed you guys by just a few months, probably. I don't, I don't remember. I remember messaging you at one point. I don't remember if that was my second or third trip or even my first trip. Um, when I messaged you, I, I think, I think it was my third trip. Do, do you happen to remember? It's funny. I was just looking at that. I think I have it on Facebook messenger. Actually. I think it was, I think it was right <laughs> when I was going there and you would give me some like really good recommendations for restaurants and stuff. Yeah. It's uh, crazy. Yeah. Let's see. My, my first uh, one from you, I think is 2009. So I don't know what trip that was for you. November. That's my what's uh, on my trip. Phone. I spent six months there on that trip. How, how about you in 2010? Was That was your first yeah. trip to Vietnam. So that was, uh, our assignments are generally between like, they're usually two or three years when you're first um, joining with the State Department, uh, you get two year assignments and then you bump up to three. And then sometimes you can extend for longer than that. But so anyhow, that, that first trip in Vietnam was uh, two years that we lived there in Ho Chi Minh City. What was, uh, one of the online questions was, what what was the least favorite place you've been to? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a harsh one to answer because that's kind of mean to who almost seems mean to whatever country you end up saying. If yeah, you want to no, I think you. that I think my truthful answer to that question is that I, I have enjoyed all the places we've been overseas um, for different reasons. And some of them were more difficult places to live than others. I mean, when we were in uh, we were in Bangladesh in 2016 to 2017. And the time that we were there, there was a security incident where there were these terrorists that basically attacked a restaurant right, right in the neighborhood where we were living. And the, you know, the whole um, city went on lockdown. We weren't able to go outside. We had to travel via uh, armored vehicle. We had to send we had, we had our two children there with us. We had to send one of our, our kids back to live in the United States for a year. So that was a, a challenging time to be in that country, in that city. Um, but it was still amazing to be there. A great food, wonderful people. Um, the work that I was doing was really compelling. At that time, I, I was the human rights officer there in, uh, in Dhaka. And so I was helping to um, follow and cover events related to human rights in that country. And it was, it was very compelling work. It was a lot of fun. And I felt like I was uh, making a difference. And so, you know, I think it's a, it's a good question. It's, you know, where, where, where was it really, you know, did you not enjoy being there? But the truth is, even though that was a really tough situation, I really enjoyed being there. Yeah. For me, I've traveled uh, four months to Sydney, Australia, six months to Vietnam, two on two occasions, six months each time. Uh, a third time. Yeah, I've been to Vietnam four times. The other two times were like two weeks two and three weeks the other two times. Um, the funny thing for Vietnam for me was the, the first time being there for six months, uh, 
at the fifth month, all the um, mopeds honking their horns, something like tripped in my head. And I'm like, I need to get back to America. All these bang, 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 bang. Like it was, it was something, something went off in my head. Like I was like going like, I was going ape shit crazy. I don't know what it was. And I was just like, I need to get back to America. I can't handle these, these horns. But it was, it's such a, I think it was probably, I think I was buying the plane ticket like that week and something must have just went off in my head saying, hey, you're going to get back to, to a civilization where you don't hear these horns every day. Because where I was staying, um, I mean, I, I think it's all in Vietnam. You kind of hear those mopeds throughout the night, even when you sleep. Um, if, you're, if, if you're lucky, you get a hotel room that's really well insulated from the sounds. But um, yeah, that, that got to me. Um, that's true. Like wherever you are, you know, I mean, there's going to be that one thing that just is a little annoying. And after a while, it just drives you nuts. I, I, it reminds me of yeah, yeah. Ho Chi Minh City. And that was the one thing that uh, drove us crazy. And my wife in particular is we would walk about three blocks from where we live to the uh, U.S. consulate there in kind of on, on Le Yuan, like right there in the center of town. And walk down the street, went to Minh mm -hmm. And you, uh, during the evenings when you walk back it was it was a one-way street and it would be totally clogged with cars right or not cars but motorbikes mostly and it would be so clogged that the motorbikes would spill out onto the sidewalks right so people are just zooming down the sidewalk and you'd be walking home you know trying to get back after a long day at work and these motorbikes just zooming past you both sides on the sidewalk and i remember by the end of being there for two years that was definitely got a little bit old you're just like ah oh, man like Come on, stay in the road. This is the sidewalk. Even though in the beginning yeah. you're like, oh, this is like a kind of fun experience. Like, what a weird quirk of of the city that you know this happens wouldn't wouldn't happen in San Diego or or Virginia, or whatever. But yeah, uh, after a while, it's just like, man, yeah. this is super annoying. I need to <laughs> I need to change the scenery. Er earlier, you mentioned um, uh, was that. Bang, Bangladesh. I forget if you said it was Bangladesh. You said something where that you would uh, the work that you were doing. You felt like you're really having an impact. Um, one of the questions online was explain to somebody that doesn't know diplomatic work at all. Like they have no idea how how you even get to work to, in that position. What you do every day and how you. They asked how does it impact America and how does it impact like say this person works at uh, a casino here. Uh, in, and San Diego at the Barona Casino or somebody that works in Las Vegas or somebody that just works at McDonald's, how explain how a diplomat could either affect it or just how that is yeah. a big picture. It's a good question because I had no idea that this category of job existed for a really long time. You know, for high school, certainly didn't know it. Through most of college, I didn't know it. And it's interesting because uh, diplomats, our foreign service officers, play a really important role, especially when you travel overseas. So there's a, you know, the De Department of State is based in Washington, D.C., and there's a, a big group of people that work there. And then in every, almost every country around the world, we have an embassy in the capital city. And the people who uh, work in those embassies are, are diplomats. And so they work for the Department of State, and they have a bunch of different kinds of jobs. So You've got people that, uh, like the job that I'm doing right now, they're economic officers. So their job is to follow economic trends, help American businesses overseas, and help coordinate U.S. economic policy. You've got people that work in the political section. They, they do the same thing on the political side. So following uh, internal political developments, uh, how different countries are interacting with each other. And you've got people that are consular officers. So those people, when you go overseas and you go down to Cancun, and you lose your passport and you're like, oh man, how am I going to get home? You go you know, to the consulate, the nearby consulate there or to the embassy in the capital city and the people that process your application to help you help get you a new passport, those are consular officers. Um, and they, you know, there are American citizen services there in, in the embassies and consulates around the world. Uh, and they, they help people to get into trouble. If you get in jail, you lose your passport. And those things and they also are the people that process visa applications so if you are a national of another country you want to travel to the united states you want to go to disneyland you go into the embassy or you go into the consulate you apply for a visa and the people that process that application interview you are, are diplomats and there's you know there are people that come for a short amount of time that are 
uh, non-immigrant visas. They come down on a tourist visa or they come to do business. And there are people that are uh, immigrants. Like, for instance, if you uh, get married to, a, 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 to an American national, you are, you're a, a Bulgarian national, you get married to an American national, and uh, you want to move to the United States, you apply for a, an immigrant visa, which allows you to come and eventually um, you know, live in the United States long term. So there's all those kinds of people are, are diplomats. And I, I had no idea, like, wow, what a weird thing. We sent people overseas. They live in each one of these countries for a few years, and they do this really, really wide range of jobs. Um, and, you know, thinking about, I like your question about, like, what does it mean, like, if I work in a casino in, in Barona or whatever, like, how are these people helping me? Um, well, there's the, if you travel overseas, if you go to Mexico, if you go to another country, these are the people that are there to help you when you get in trouble. And in fact, that's one of the main, main reasons that we have embassies and consulates hmm. is to help Americans when they travel overseas. But the other thing that we do, and what I'm doing right now, which is pretty cool, is we help American businesses. And I work a lot with the, uh, with the Commerce Department. So, within, so there's the State Department that I work for, and then there's the Commerce Department. The Commerce Department, one of their big responsibilities is helping American businesses, helping people export um, the American products overseas. And I work with their foreign uh, commercial officers, so they're, they're diplomats overseas, and we help to identify uh, opportunities for American businesses. And, and there's a, an office in San Diego uh, that's called, uh, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's a USIAC, and basically they, they have an office that helps American companies that want to sell stuff overseas figure out markets and where to sell, sell their stuff. And they'll contact uh, the Commerce Department officer and, or, or someone like me, and then we look for opportunities, we help to link them up, and we help them to sell products. And so, I spend a lot of my day, you know, so meeting like with if, American if, companies, figuring out what their problems are, figuring out how to uh, help their businesses succeed. So say, uh, this, I'm just gonna ask, I guess uh, it might sound like a stupid question, but I just don't know. Say if I were to open a IT services business, I do programming, say i is it general i'm guessing your maybe your economic or your ties with the economy there i guess uh might be more specific but anyways if i if i wanted to open up it services doing programming can i go to can i call bangkok um embassy and then like say hey do you have some type of need for do you know a sector in Thailand that needs programming? Is that how it works? Or no, it's, we off? do have people that do that. And I, especially, um, yeah, I, I, we have people that do that, contact the embassy directly. And often it's, uh, it'll be people that are in country already. So like if there's, if you had your IT company based in California and then you, had, you were opening up a new branch here in Bangkok, you, you could come to the embassy or you would, you know, contact the embassy and set up a meeting and talk about um, opportunities and how, how, how there might be ways for us to help. Um, but generally when people are in the United States, what they end up doing is they work through these offices that are located domestically in the United States. So there's one in San Diego, um, there's one in Chicago, there's, I think there's something, there's maybe a maybe hundred of them or something like that in the United States. And the person in those offices in the United States would connect you with the person that works in the embassy in the country that you wanted to export your product to. And gotcha. you mentioned IT services, there... I think services are an export also. So just like, just, you know, you're selling widgets, you know, selling car parts or something, but you could also be selling services and those also, those receive the same kind of treatment. Um, on the, with the title of, I, I think it was economic mm -hmm. officer, diplomat, is that, um, and then feel free if there's st stuff that you can't oh, yeah. answer, feel free to say that and then we'll, we'll skip it. Um, What's a typical day like for you? And what are some of the requests that comes across that yeah, you have to deal that's with? Yeah, a good question. And every day is super different for me. Um, so one of my primary responsibilities is to know what's happening in the country and the topics that I cover. And so in my office, um, the co topics that I cover are related to environment, science, technology, and health, and energy. And so big, big buckets of, of stuff that's going on. And so, you know, I wake up every morning, I read the newspaper, I, uh, I, I try to figure out what's, what's happening in one of those, in each one of those topics. And then maybe I'll see something interesting. Uh, oh, there's a new energy tender that's out. The government's, uh, 
has just announced. So I'll call up my contact at the Ministry of Energy and I'll say, hey, I'd love to know more about this tender. Can, can we set up a meeting? Maybe I'll go out for a meeting. I'll, uh, we'll have our local staff person that uh, supports me on these kinds, kinds of issues. Come with me, we'll go talk, we'll find out a little bit more. And we'll, then we'll, after that meeting, we'll be like, okay, well, maybe uh, this other company, this American company would be interested in this. Let's see if they have anybody that's working in this area. So we'll call up the American company, they set up another meeting. And then all of a sudden the ambassador says, hey, you know, I just heard about this development. You got to come in and brief us and tell us what's going on on that. So and I'll go back to the office. We'll set up a meeting with the ambassador. We'll brief her or him on what's going on. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden Washington's calling and saying, hey, you know, we heard that there's this development. Can you, get, can you give us the latest scoop on it? So, you know, maybe sometime in the evening, because we've got a 12 hour time difference, we'll set up a call with Washington, brief them on what's going on. So, you know, that's kind of an example of how a day could go from, there's a, a development in the morning, I get information about it, I uh, go out and seek more details, and then I brief all the relevant people, whether they're um, my, my ultimate boss, the uh, ambassador here, uh, people in Washington, D.C., or American companies that might be interested. Are you looking to, uh, event? I think one of the, on or if I remember correctly, one of the online questions was, uh, do you want to become an ambassador? And then what's, and then secondly, what was the route that you took to get to your position? Yeah. Actually? So I think answer the first question, would you like to be an ambassador? Absolutely. That's kind of the pinnacle of our, of our career. I don't think everybody yep. wants to necessarily because it's, it's a tough job. You know, you got to make difficult decisions and um, there's a lot of pressure. Um, it's also really challenging to get to that place. So um, how it works is, so I joined the State Department as a career foreign service officer. And I didn't know this, but the only thing you need to do to become a foreign service officer is you just take a test, basically. You sign up and they offer these uh, written tests. So you you go and you go to like a, a facility and you, you take this test, you know, it's about civics and uh, your knowledge of foreign events and, um, a, a, you know, kind of very broad, almost like an SAT kind of test. So you take that and if you pass that test, then they have you um, take another kind of test that's more like essays and writing about what your um, knowledge is in a couple of different categories. And then if you pass that, you'd take an, uh, an in-person exam and they'll, you fly to Washington, D.C., you sit for like a several hour test where it's with other people. It's not quite like Men in Black, but it's like that. You know, you go and you have like uh, scenarios and things that you um, have to use your brain, think on the fly and show your ability to reason and think. So you go through this kind of multi-step process. And if you pass that test, um, then you uh, become a foreign service officer and um, it's a it's an upper out system. So every few years you have to get promoted, and if you don't get promoted, then you then you're out. And uh, that sometimes, as you get to more senior levels, can be be challenging. And uh, ultimately, you know, you move up through the system. You if you're really successful, you become a senior foreign service officer. You become part of the that that group, and then. Um, it, once you've been in for a while, you could be considered for an ambassadorship, but you're you're nominated by the president. So the president selects um, who who she or he wants to have uh, be ambassadors to each country, and then they um, and then they have to be uh, Congress has to um, actually approve those appointments. So it's it's a really long process. I don't think you can necessarily say, I, I want to be ambassador and, and, you know, make it happen. You have to kind of be in the right place, the right time. You have to kind of work the system. And, and that's, that's kind of the main way. The other way you can become an ambassador is that the, the president also has political appointed um, ambassadors. So our ambassador in, in Thailand right now is, is a business person and he worked for 25 years uh, in Asia working on business stuff. And so uh, the current president said, this person has a lot of knowledge and skills that I think would be helpful. And then they can be appointed to be the ambassador in that case too. So we've got some politically appointed ambassadors that kind of come from the, the outside of the State Department. And then we have some career foreign service officers um, that are kind of moved their way up through the system to become ambassador. Did uh, at any point in your career, did you feel that you were in over your head? Every day. <laughs> So the funny thing about this job is you are a generalist, right? 
So every post that I go to, I do a different job and I have to learn not only the ins and outs of that country and what's going on there, but also a, a totally different function that I'm doing. So like when I did my, my first job in, uh, when I did my job in DACA, I was, I was the human rights officer. So I had to learn how to you know, write reports and brief and do all these different things um, related to human rights. And I, when I went to Manila, I was a consular officer. So I had to learn how to interview people for visas. I had to, I spent some time um, helping American citizens in the American Citizen Services Unit. Um, and there's a whole, you know, different group of uh, policies and programs and things that you need to be familiar with. So you are constantly in this career, constantly learning new things and being thrown in the deep end. And just, you've got to figure it out and make it work. And um, yeah, I, I think often people feel over their head and the most successful foreign service officers are those who can get comfortable with that, get up to speed quickly and just uh, learn how to make it work. I thought of that question kind of thinking like if you went in straight, well, it sounded like you went to, you went to Stanford and you, you straight went into that career. Like you didn't, did you take a, a year break, two year break or anything, or it just, it just went from high school, Stanford. And I took a break career? after, um, after college, after Stanford, I, I worked um, in uh, the private sector for a while. So I worked doing environmental work for about seven years oh, okay. before I became a foreign service officer myself. So I was, uh, I was doing a different kind of job. I was working actually with fishermen and um, environmental folks uh, in California to set up a network of marine protected areas. And so, yeah, it was challenging and exciting and new and I felt like it was a really great job um, but I had some time to kind of build up some expertise in environmental stuff and get used to working um, before I, I did this, this specific job. Um, back in 2004, 2006, I was working as a Navy contractor doing mm -hmm. software. And uh, uh, the software was pretty simple. It boiled down to each uh, ship uh, uh, whatever ship that we provided our software on, uh, it had basically just a green, yellow, or red light. Uh, and green means the ship is ready for war, and red means that they didn't prep correctly. One of their mission mm -hmm. areas failed. And the ship would be 50, I, I forget now. Um, I wanna say 56 mission areas. I might be wrong on the number. Somewhere. So each mission area would have a specific amount of questions like a firefighter. Uh, did, did they get from point A to point B in the ship within 30 seconds? Did they suit up within 15 seconds? And somebody would be writing all this down. So we digitized it and they would upload it. They would get it to their ship server. It would get sent via satellite, get to us. And then my software would, uh, the whole thing was the software of the company that we built. So from being on that tablet that they ha had where they record the, the answer, putting on a thumb drive, putting on the server, server satellite down back to San Diego. Um, so at one point, one of the ships turned, um, I think red mm. and Admiral called the off the, uh, the software office. And I picked up and I, I said, uh, the department's name, I said, this is Lim Lee. And then he's, uh, this is Admiral something, something. Why is my ship red? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Give me a minute. And then my, my, my manager came up to me. He's like, do you know, who you just spoke to that's a an Admiral. Um, do you know, you, you should, you should, uh, you should say a certain title to him and speak to him in a certain way. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm young, young and dumb. You know, I was like, Hey, I'm only, I'm, I'm going to work as fast as I can to anybody. It doesn't matter who it is. Yeah. And I know, I know that he's, he's a little bit upset that his ship is red. So it doesn't matter. I'm going to work as hard as I can, whether I, whether I say something polite to him or not, but Growing older, looking back at that, I was like, well, yeah, you know, young, almost, almost over, over my head or in over my head on certain things, but, you know, pulled through, got through, um, be, I, I believe in my own eyes did, did pretty good job as a, as a software engineer. So, yeah. um, I think that's, yeah, when you talk about, okay. go ahead. Uh, I was, oh, go ahead. I think what uh, you're saying, I mean, it's really, that's the difference between private sector and, and government in a lot of ways, you know, and, and not all government, but military and, and the job I'm in in the foreign service is just like that. It's very hierarchical. You know, there's, 
there's titles, there are people who are above you and you're, you're deferential to them. You gotta, you know, go through the chain of command. And it's weird, like I worked in the private sector for a few years before joining the State Department and I enjoyed that flat kind of uh, hierarchy, you know, you could, and just, you know, if you're competent, if you do your job well and quickly, then, you know, you get, you don't have to like bow down to whoever, you know, you can you can just do your job and, and get respect for it. And so it's interesting to go from that to a system that's more like the one that you're talking about with the colonel where, you know, there's a certain amount of respect that's demanded and yeah. do things a certain way. And uh, yeah, it takes some adjustment, I think. There's, there's yeah. in that hierarchy too, but um, yeah, it's a different system. Yeah. Um, let's see, another online question. If you could take this, uh, this one's an abstract question. I like it, but it's abstract. If you could take a trait from all the different places you've been to, what would it look like? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, that's right. I saw that on your Facebook page. And I think that um, I thought about that overnight a little bit. And it's hard to generalize, you know, across countries because they're all so different and have different problems. And, but I, I think the number one thing that I thought about was, in each of the countries that I've lived, um, it's always been a challenge to figure out how to help the most needy people. And each one of those countries was trying to do it in their own different way, you know. And in uh, Zimbabwe, when we were there, there was a big problem with drought and, and food security and kind of distribution of resources. Um, in Dhaka, you know, there was a problem with climate change and, and more storms and flood damage. Um, in, in, in each of these places, um, there are vulnerable people and the government with all its warts and flaws and, and, and good things too, was trying to figure out how, how to help people. And it's not that different from the United States, you know, identifying who are the most vulnerable people and how to get, um, how to get resources to them in the most efficient way. And so I think if I had to generalize across all the different places where we've lived, the number one thing that those governments could be and people there are trying to do is to help those most vulnerable. And um, and it's just a really tough job. And, you know, there's a lot of lessons learned for how to do it efficiently. And and, there, and there's a role for, for the United States there too. You know, I think that we have great overseas um, programs like your USAID and other, other groups where we're helping to facilitate uh, governments providing assistance to those who are most vulnerable. So that, that's kind of, that's what I came up with when I was thinking about all the different places we've lived and what was common among them. Uh, I'll, I'll pro I'm going to rephrase a little bit what you said and add my own twist on it. When you said like, a, it's just a human with whole, with warts. And you said that about the government, but probably the, I'm thinking the way you explained it, uh, you got different areas with uh, flooding problems, like you said, the hunger problems, uh, probably hospital problems, all sorts of problems. So it's just a human with scars, warts, skin tags maybe a broken bone that you don't see that was fixed and uh so it's just that if i to answer this person's question i guess it, that's what i would imagine from your story mm -hmm. uh, the trait is just a human being with scars and or uh, flaws but that's just what it is yeah absolutely um let's see the next question can you can you tell us anything about what we see in the news as sonic microwave attacks on places like our embassy in Cuba. Yeah, yeah, this is in the news a while ago. And I, I have to say that I, I don't have any more information about that other than what's been reported in the media. But it's definitely, I think to broaden it a little bit, you know, there's uh, stuff that happens overseas a lot. And we have embassies that have um, suffered attacks of various kinds in the past. And it's definitely not a, um, it's a career that's not without its risks, right? And so it's something, stuff like that that happens is uh, definitely scary. And, you know, we're overseas with our families. Like I was telling you in 2016, when we were in Dhaka, we were on our way to dinner. Um, we're driving our car along and uh, it was a long day and we, we'd been in some with some friends. So we we're going to go to this restaurant that everybody goes to in Dhaka. It was maybe, you know, half mile from our house. And uh, my kid starts crying and screaming. We're like, oh my God, so annoying. I guess we'll just go, let's just pick up some, uh, we'll get some takeout, we're gonna get some Korean chicken and just, you know, go back to our place. We get back home and we get this, 
alert over our phones that there's an attack in progress happening at the restaurant that we were going to go to, you know, and it's, uh, it ends up being this uh, 24 hour siege where um, this terrorist organization took hostages at that hotel and, and killed uh, a number of people, including an American citizen there. And so it was a real wake up call that, oh my gosh, you know, stuff like this happens overseas. Um, and, you know, you might not hear about it when you're back in the States, but it's, it's very real for the people that are living in those cities. And in, in that particular case, it was pretty close to, to me and my family. And um, it was, yeah, it was a scary moment. So kind of looping, looping back to what the questioner is saying, you know, I, I don't have any information on that particular attack. And that was uh, happened in a different part of the world than I've been working in, but it's uh, stuff like that does happen. And, you know, we don't always have all the details and on, not all the details are always public, but it's, um, yeah, it happened with some frequency for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to find one question. I remember someone uh, asked, but I can't find it in this list. Either it's here and I'm not seeing it or I forgot to write it down. It was something to the extent of they asked, um, in the movies like, uh, 007, um, diplomats and whatnot are like trained like that is that true they they're I'm, I'm sure they're joking to some to some degree but they want to know uh maybe from your experience or what you've heard from other diplomats with with correlations of that yeah well so we do have we get training to go overseas and uh, and do our jobs and there's uh there's kind of functional training for your job and then there's language training so i've spent a lot of time at our training facility, which is uh, in outside of Washington, D.C., in Virginia. And every few years in between assignments, we go there and get uh, all kinds of different training. So I learned training on how to, um, how to you know, write reports. And uh, I mean, it's not all super exciting stuff. Maybe it's not like the movies, you know, but uh, we, we go out there and get training on, you know, uh, topical areas, um, how to do kind of specific kinds of jobs. Um, you know, how to, how to work all the IT systems that we use to process visas and passport applications, things like that. But actually, the most exciting training we get to do is language training. And so I've learned um, from the U.S. government, uh, Vietnamese, uh, Bengali, and, uh, and Thai language. And so I spent time at this facility in Virginia learning how to speak those languages in an intensive way. So eight hours a day, or in the case of Thai, for like 10 months and uh, learning how to both read and, and speak the language. And it is the coolest thing. I mean, it's amazing. I, I can't believe that you, we get this opportunity to acquire this skill. I mean, I, you, you, I'm sure you know, like being overseas, going to Vietnam, like your ability to make friends and experience the place where you're living is so much enhanced by your ability to communicate with just regular people. And so, I mean, I'm just so thankful for that ability and it helps us to do our jobs. I mean, I. I went up, uh, I've taken a lot of trips uh, domestically in Thailand since I've been here for a few months. And every time I go outside of the capital and I go to a, a meeting, you know, I go and I give my introductory remarks in Thai. I uh, ask questions in Thai, I have these conversations in Thai. And there's no way I could have done that without having some language ability. So, and, and then you just develop these friendships and personal connections that really help you to do your job better. So that's, that's the most exciting training that I've, I've got to experience. I, I absolutely loved my time in Vietnam each each and every time. I probably oddly like I feel like I have more neighbors there than I have neighbors here in a sense that not just that if I went across the street right now, I don't know who my neighbor is. Right? Right. I know I I know more neighbors where my uncle lives in Vietnam. I know more neighbors where my life my wife lives in Vietnam or where she lived in Vietnam. Like it, it's just it's a strange different culture. But I have so much more fun when I'm in Vietnam than, I guess, to some extent of certain life here in America when it comes to that. I think there's such a great sense of community. That's one of the, my favorite things about living in, in Vietnam was that, you know, just people, for better or worse, are in everybody's business, right? And uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. It, yeah, me and my wife t uh, talk about that quite often, actually. She says, um, uh, it, she'll use the word, it's... it's uh, Translated, uh, it's, bo it's boring here in America, but she's saying uh, like uh, she doesn't have family and she doesn't know her neighbors here. Mm -hmm. um, but like, but then she says, yeah, if we went back in Vietnam, everybody would be in our business, be in her business. And, uh, you know, there's that fund of people being in your business, but then 
you, you get you could get sick of it uh, sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a real sense of, of right. like we're in this together, and you know I think people collectively kind of are working to solve problems. And I think there, there's a definite benefit on that side. And yeah. Like immigrant communities in the United States, I think, especially, you know, in San Diego, we've got a big Vietnamese population. In Virginia, there's a, a large Vietnamese um, diaspora. And it's interesting to see kind of just how those connections are so important and, you know, businesses thrive because people are helping each other. And I don't know, there's something, there is something good about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that is something when being in the being around my uncle's house in vietnam being around my wife's uh uh family it's interesting where their extended friends they're so much more involved like that i i feel like i don't experience as experience that here in america meaning um like I don't know the at my uncle's neighborhood everybody knew my face and yet I didn't know anybody like I mean I might have met them once I might remember their name but there were so many people where I didn't at one point there uh, my cousins like oh yeah you met this person I'm like uh, and but that person's already saying my name saying hello I'm like, well, how do you know my name? But it's it's stuff like that that collective culture, or maybe just the culture itself. People are just more friend. Uh, I don't want to use the word friendly. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe like pulling people in. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. All There's right. Something to be learned from that for sure. No, I I, I do. I spend a lot of my time thinking about. Um, american lifestyle like i was born here i don't know i don't know like if i was born in vietnam maybe i would yeah you, you wouldn't have the option to think about it differently in the sense of i live here in america i could see how the culture of family is i wish family was closer to what it was in vietnam the way people treat each other but then i i understand there's vietnam there is the kind of bad side of Vietnamese culture where say an elder always is right so that is a hard pill to swallow if you come from Americans uh, culture an American culture where if someone's wrong you could call them out on it mm -hmm. they you, you don't have to shut up just because they're older um, that's one aspect of the v Vietnamese culture that that would, is tough for Americans and I I, I don't know I don't really like it either that elders are always correct. I think it should go on who is right. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's some, but like you're saying, there's something to learn on both sides. I think, I think there's times where I hear Vietnamese people complain about the American culture. And there's times I hear certain uh, Vietnamese Americans that are that acclimated to the American culture that complain about the Vietnamese culture. And I, I try to tell them both sides, like, Hey, I think you guys need to kind of, see what's good here, understand why the bad things happen, see what's good here, and then try to find a way to melt it together, but explain it to everyone so both sides understand. Um, there's actually one that me and my wife have discussed quite a bit where, and the Vietnamese culture, When if, if I go back to Vietnam, I have to buy quite a bit of gifts for my, I, culturally, I have to buy a bunch of gifts, like a lot of gifts. Yeah. And... The family over there doesn't understand the how much money we make here in America and how much our bills are. And yes, we do have more money typically than them, but typically we do. But I have a couple cousins where they're really fortunate. Like well, I have a cousin where I feel like he lives amazing life over there. In my opinion, he lives a he lives a much better life than I do. He's like out partying out going to all these nice restaurants all the time he at a point owned a car which you probably under you probably know owning a car in vietnam is not cheap yeah. yeah so he's living the life up over there like even when i was there actually last trip there's a time where i was like hey let's uh let's go on a weekend trip and then let's use the let's use the train to save a few bucks and then he was like no let's let's buy an airplane ticket i'm like 
thing. I'm an Amer I'm an American who supposedly has more money supposedly, um, and I'm suggesting let's take the train, and he's suggesting take buy an airplane ticket uh, for that vacation. So it was just uh, things are changing, and the, some of the some of the people don't understand that difference. I think um, there some of some people are judging me. They're like, oh, you're an American. You need you need to bring a lot of gifts when you come back. So that that. Uh, me and my wife are trying to talk about that and it's just, it's a it's challenging you know yeah Break. yeah it's one of the real advantages of being overseas in some of these posts that i've been in is that the cost of living is very very different than being in the united states you know and like you said you know a yeah. ticket can be same price as a bus ticket sometimes you know yeah it's awesome yeah. i mean it makes it when you're overseas and you get to take advantage of that and travel and Go to nice restaurants and you can really live large which is pretty cool yeah um oh is this the oh no okay let's take another online question um can you tell us about zimbabwe uh they they write i think most americans have just a stereotype image of primitive g generic africa what is the re u.s relationship with zimbabwe can you paint a picture of what it's like there? Tell us a story that illustrates life there. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that I, I don't know if I could have found Zimbabwe on a map before we went there. I think you're right that it's just, um, when you kind of hear it, you're like, oh, it must be in Africa. Like, how is it different from other places? Um, but it is, it is such a cool country and I really, really enjoyed our time there. It's located in Southern Africa. So you think of like South Africa, it's at the very bottom of the continent. And just north of that is Zimbabwe. And it's a landlocked country in between, um, got kind of Mozambique on one side and the Indian Ocean side. And then you got Namibia and Botswana kind of on the other side. And um, it's, it's an agriculture, you know, it, it used to be the, the bread basket of, of Southern Africa. Really um, productive in terms of agriculture and uh, growing corn, but growing all kinds of other products. They actually had an uh, interesting um, range of different uh, different agricultural products that they grow there. And they basically had this big uh, economic collapse. Uh, they had a redistribution of land that happened, um, kind of associated with uh, their transition from being a, a colony um, into having their own government and then um, having a a system where things were uh, not not well distributed, I guess. Um, and so it was, uh, they basically had this big economic collapse, agricultural production went way down and um, they, they struggled over the last few years with kind of leadership, with uh, uh, economic issues. It was in 2009, Zimbabwe had one of the highest rates of uh, inflation ever in the world. Like, you know, you think of like wheelbarrows full of money that are, not worth anything like that's that was a situation in Zimbabwe and people had difficulty getting basic goods um, and, and surviving. And so uh, I think, you know, the thing for Americans to know is that, you know, there is this country that has incredible potential. I mean, some of the most intelligent people I've met, um, if you go to uh, countries in Southern Africa and you, you know, you're often I'll be in like a hotel or something like that and talking with somebody and they really seem on it and bright and turns out that they had left Zimbabwe looking for other opportunities and they're, you know, working in neighboring countries where the economies were a little bit stronger. Um, it just, it's a country that has incredible potential um, and has struggled for a variety of political and economic reasons over the last, you know, decades. Um, so when I was there in uh, Zimbabwe, I was working on environmental issues um, and, and part of my portfolio. We worked a lot on counter wildlife trafficking. So this is, uh, uh, Zimbabwe has a lot of these game animals that you can think of, so like elephants and... Uh, uh, no, I think it's good now, I think. Okay, if it becomes a problem, yeah. you know, I'll just... Okay. Um, okay, you're, you're talking about Zimbabwe? Yeah, yeah, so okay, so so like, uh, you had a question about like what, what we know about Zimbabwe, and so, you know, it's kind of an interesting place that has a lot of potential, but has a lot, had a lot of problems. When I was there, I was working as an economic officer, so similar to what I'm doing here in Thailand, um, but my focus, a lot of what I was doing was working on counter wildlife trafficking. So you, what we, would happen is you would have these poachers that would go to Zimbabwe and they, uh, they didn't have a lot of resources to protect some of their amazing animals that they had. So, you know, 
they have a huge elephant population there. There's rhinos, there's lions, there's all kinds of really amazing um, African animals that, that live there. And they have a national park system where they're protected, but unfortunately, a lot of the rangers there just don't have resources. You know, they first of all, they don't have a lot of tourists. Um, so there's not a lot of money coming in from that. And the government uh, doesn't have a lot of resources to dedicate to, to some of these rangers. You have guys that you know, wouldn't have shoes, let alone guns or anything like that to, to do their job. So uh, you have poachers that would come in and kill these animals. And then um, things like rhino horn would uh, be shipped uh, to uh, consumer markets that were in Asia. So, you know, uh, there are markets in Vietnam, there are markets in China, there are markets kind of all over the place. So uh, a, a big part of my job was to help uh, understand that situation and uh, to the extent possible uh, provide U.S. support for counter wildlife trafficking efforts. And it was really, I mean, it was interesting. I went to a lot of different uh, rural locations. I talked with a lot of rangers, a lot of uh, environmental organizations that were trying to help address this transnational crime issue. And, and the thing about wildlife trafficking is you think, okay, well, who cares about these animals? You know, they're, you know, uh, it's sad for them, but doesn't really have any other impact. But a lot of the same organizations that traffic uh, wildlife species are also involved in uh, smuggling of drugs, smuggling of people, um, a lot, uh, money laundering, all different kinds of illicit activities. So it was really interesting to get a window into that world kind of through the environmental side. Hmm. Did, uh, did you get to travel while you're in or did you travel in zimbabwe a lot or were you kind of like headquartered yeah uh in a certain area we did we travel a lot so the the capital city is uh called harare it used to be called the name um when the british were uh controlling the country it was called salisbury um and then when zimbabwe got its independence they changed it to harare so that's the capital city that's where we live it's a kind of a small town it's not um uh, not huge. It's definitely not the size of San Diego. Um, and so we would get out, we had a car and we would drive all over the place. We drive to national parks, beautiful, beautiful locations. And because there's not a lot of, um, tourists, like I was saying, we need to have these places to ourselves in a lot of cases. Then we also took road trips. We drove all the way from Harare. We drove all the way to the, um, Atlantic ocean, you know, drove through Botswana and, um, Namibia. And then we, we went out, the other way out to Mozambique, went to the beach there. We go down to South Africa. So we traveled quite a bit. Um, did a lot of kind of outdoors stuff, like mountain biking, um, hiking, um, stuff, just taking advantage of the beautiful, beautiful um, natural resources the country had. And, you know, uh, the capital city, the, when the British um, controlled a lot of these uh, countries in Southern Africa, they established their capitals in these higher elevation places. So there weren't as many mosquitoes and they didn't have to deal with malaria as much. So Ferrari is at like, uh, it's like 5,000 feet above sea level, something like that. So super nice weather, like very, um, for the most part, like warm and dry um, with not a lot of bugs. And so it was just a great place to live. And um, I did a lot of running there. Actually, one of the um, marathons, you asked about marathons earlier. So I did a this one called the Two Oceans Marathon down in South Africa. So I trained a lot of the mm -hmm. group of these guys in Ferrari um, who were good runners and then took a trip down um, to Cape Town, which is down in kind of the Southern part of um, South Africa. And it's, they have this marathon. It's actually an ultra marathon because it's a little bit longer than 26 miles, but um, it goes kind of all the way around this peninsula where you go on and kind of on one side, there's the Indian Ocean, and on the other side is the um, Atlantic Ocean. So it's pretty cool, like really an amazing experience to run in this big race, and all different nice. people from all over the place were there. So yeah, it was fun. Hmm. Really fun place to live, and mm -hmm. I think off the beaten track for sure in terms of what most Americans travel and go see. Um, on that note, uh, kind of off the beaten track for Americans, um, do you think Zimbabwe? Like there, I stereotype certain um, um, me as an American, but I feel like I'm more prone to travel than most Americans. So is Zimbabwe like uh, how would I say it? Like somebody that wants to go to, uh, beautiful beaches that's pictur picturesque. So like Hawaii, um, 
uh, what, what else, Cayman Islands or something, uh, what would you suggest Zimbabwe to, the, to those type of people or who would you suggest Zimbabwe to? Yeah, that's, so I think Americans tend to think of countries in Africa being all the same, right? And it's just, yeah. it's, I don't know if it's our education system or just lack of familiarity, but you know, there's over 50 countries in Africa and they're all really unique and different. And I think that uh, going to, uh, on safari in Kenya or Tanzania is really different from going um, to, you know, go whale watching in South Africa is really different from going, you know, whatever to Cairo and seeing the pyramids in the northern part of the continent, right? So all really different. So I think that um, uh, few Americans travel to Zimbabwe because there have been these, there's been kind of political and economic unrest over the last few years. And so I, it, a lot of the Americans that end up going there are game hunters. So it is legal to go and hunt there and and you can do it with right permits and all that stuff. And so a lot of the Americans we ran across were uh, interested in, in that particular kind of tourism. But actually one, one thing that, um, and oh, I mentioned earlier, it's landlocked, so there's no beach. Like you can't go to a beautiful beach in, in Zimbabwe because there's no beach there, except for maybe a mm -hmm. few lakes and stuff. But um, hmm. one of the, the other big things that people go to Zimbabwe to see is Victoria Falls, which is kind of in the northwestern part of the country and it's on the border it's on a border area with uh, Zambia in the north, and then there's also Botswana in the west. And so it's this beautiful, beautiful waterfall, and a lot of people go um, go specifically to see that. And often people fly into Victoria Falls specifically. They never never get to the capital. They never go to Harare, um, but they'll do it hmm. as part of like a southern African trip. Well, yeah. Uh, thing and uh, just a kind of quick plug is that uh, for Americans that are traveling overseas. Um, the State Department does maintain like a website that has information on um, not only visas and stuff, but also on like uh, safety and security and all the different things you might know. And it's always um, updated based on like the the situation on the ground. So it's called travel.state.gov. And so that's whenever we travel somewhere, we always uh, log on to that website to see, you know, what the latest is in conditions and stuff. And so when you're traveling to a place like Zimbabwe, you know, you're want to make sure that it's safe and that you know whatever you got all your shots and you know what the situation is on the ground and it's a it's a good kind of one-stop shop for that kind of information what was that site again travel dot travel dot state dot g o v okay g o v oh, oh gov. okay cool um on the kind of a random thought i had with your diplomatic uh career um what do you feel is probably the most um What's the word I'm looking for? Um, what's like the best thing that you've accomplished during your diplomatic career? Mm. That you could talk about maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, that's hard. Cause like I said, I've done a lot of different kinds of jobs when we've been overseas. Um, I have to say like one of the most rewarding things and, and it still makes me feel emotional is that um, one of the things I did when I was living in uh, Manila in the Philippines is I worked in this American Citizen Services Unit. And we would, uh, one of the, the functions of that unit is that when you have Americans that have kids overseas, um, the, the child is not automatically an American citizen. So a lot of people don't know, actually. Like if you're an American, you, you, uh, you're living overseas somewhere and you have a child, you think, oh, well, I'm American, they'll be American you know, what's the big deal? But it turns out there's like a process for getting their citizenship. And you go into the embassy and you apply for this thing called a consular report of birth abroad, a CRIBA. And, and the people in this particular unit that I was working in are the ones that interview people. They look at, look at all the different criteria and they, they grant this thing. And I, 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 every time I had one of these interviews, we do, you know, several of them a day. I, I just always felt so happy and excited. And, you know, it was like this new... Yeah, you get to be the person that helps this this new, usually baby, you know, get their American citizenship and all the things, the wonderful things that go with that. And it's, uh, I, I don't know, when I think back of all the different things, you know, I mean, I've, I, I've helped uh, minority uh, people in, in DACA figure out ways to um, uh, get support that they needed to deal with uh, terrorists that were targeting them. I've, I've helped to... Um, 
reduce uh, wildlife trafficking in Africa. I've helped to promote American companies um, and their businesses here in, in Thailand. But somehow that that personal connection, you know, with people and looking them in the eye, looking at the parents, looking at the child. I don't know. It was just it was just really really rewarding, and I I, I really enjoyed that that work. And also, you know, in that same job, I was helping not only uh, people in that situation who are uh, getting their citizenship, but then also when Americans were really down in the dumps and had problems, they were in jail. They, you know, maybe they lost all their money, they lost their passport, and uh, yeah, helping those people. I mean, they call the embassy up and. The, I'd be the person on the other end of the phone talking them through it. Or I, I talked to Americans um, in the United States whose loved ones had had died or who were sick in the hospital. And like being being able to help those people was extremely rewarding. And uh, yeah, I think one of the best things that I've done while being overseas. The, were both your kids, uh, you have two kids, right? I do. I have two, an eight-year-old. Were, yeah. were they both born in on uh, U.S. soil or... Uh, um, uh, on foreign soil. They were they were both born in the United States. So one was born in uh, uh, at the uh, same hospital where I was born down. Uh, in uh, and then uh, the other one was born in Virginia. So we just have uh, uh, the time they worked out uh, where we would just happen to be in between assignments. We were back in the United States and it worked out where they were born there. But we have lots of friends that um, have kids overseas. We have, I mean, here in, in Thailand, they've got some of the best medical care anywhere in the world. And Tons of people have their babies here. It's pretty common. And yeah. for us, it just yeah. I mean, that we're there. I was gonna say if uh, I was gonna ask you if you had your kids born on foreign soil, did you the person that you, that did your paperwork for your kid to get citizenship? Were you able to converse with them, knowing that you like you've done that job, and you know what what it feels like to be on their side? So that 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 was gonna be what my question was. Yeah. No, I haven't had that. Haven't had that experience, but I. Can, like, <laughs> We had actually, um, my wife was pregnant with our first child in uh, Vietnam when we were there. And we did mm -hmm. our medical care and stuff there. And it was really actually, we went to the, if I remember it right, the F, F Franco Viet Hospital, I think, in District 7. I think that's where it was. And uh, we got all our paperwork from it still, all the ultrasounds and stuff. And it's all in Vietnamese and, and uh, French. It's really funny. So we did all our medical care and stuff there. And then, yeah, she, she gave birth. Uh, back in San Diego. Hmm. Nice. What, uh, on the diplomatic thing, uh, what makes a good diplomat? Yeah. Uh, kind of like what I was saying, there's a lot of different kinds of jobs. So you could be good. Um, you could be good at uh, writing and, and analytical stuff and be a really great diplomat in terms of like understanding a situation and foreign policy. Um, you could be a person that um, is uh, really has good interpersonal skills and it helps it really good when people are in need. So like that consular function that I mentioned where you're helping American citizens who are in jail or lost their passport, like having that empathy and able to work with them, like that, that would make uh, for a good diplomat in that situation. Somebody who's really detail oriented. We have a whole category of diplomats that are the ones that are run our embassies. You know, they're the management folks that do all the HR and run our medical units and all our different stuff. Like you have to have really good organizational skills to be good in that um, category of diplomacy. So I, I think um, the one thing that is common among all of those is that having the ability to be flexible and creative and um, and get up to speed quickly, especially since you're always in a new country with new new evolving situations is, is the most important thing. Um, your success in your particular job function depends a little bit on what you're doing and, and the situation in the country. Almost like a jack of all trades, but being able to learn a uh, yeah jack of all trades, learn a new trade at the same time. Yeah, exactly. It's better. I mean, like as you get more senior, you know, you've done more jobs in the same kind of function. Like you've done more of these economic officer jobs. You know what's involved. You get better and better at it. But you're always in a new place with like new government, new political situation, new economic situation. So yeah, you really have to be flexible and, and, and be a jack of all trades. And you never know, like in this country, maybe, you know, negotiating a civil nuclear agreement is the highest priority thing. And you've got to like learn the lingo to how to talk to nuclear scientists. And maybe in this other country, it's, uh, you know, oil and gas is the most important thing. So you've got to figure out, oh, well, how do I talk to, uh, you know, 
people that are doing oil exploration and, and, and understand their process and markets and all that stuff. So everywhere you go, even if you're doing the same kind of job, you're going to have like different categories of things you're working on, different language, different kinds of people. So you, yeah, you, being flexible is super important. Yeah. What uh, country was your favorite to live in? Out of all yeah, that, it's such a hard question. Yeah, I, <laughs> like I think that they've all been great for different reasons. Um, I I really like you know our first place that we got posted overseas was Vietnam, and I think it still um, has kind of a special place in my heart. Just it was I was I was you know had limited travel growing up, and I, here was this opportunity. This whole world was open to me, and by the way, I got to learn the language, so I could make all these local friends and explore those whole in the wall coffee shops. And I mean, Vietnam has some of the best food in the world, so we just we had great food, we had great friends, we had great adventures and travel. Um, and because it was our first assignment overseas, I just it was really a special special place for me. But every one of the assignments after that has been fun for different reasons. You know, I mean. Gosh, I, I loved exploring Southern Africa and taking these road trips across the African plain where you're looking out at all these different amazing animals and, and, and the culture and the music there was so great. And then we went to Dhaka, which has this great history of, um, of language and culture and music. And um, I, I, it was different. I wasn't familiar with Southern Asia very much. So that was a really neat experience. Um, living in the Philippines, we have this great American connection with the Philippines and with Filipino people, especially coming from San Diego. Everybody had a, had a relative that was from San Diego, and I, I felt like I connected with <laughs> a personal level uh, in the Philippines just because of that, that long history between our two countries. And then Thailand is just, man, it's like a tourism mecca. You know, I mean, there's just anything you can imagine. Like you talk about, you want to go to a beautiful beach? They got that. You want to go rock climbing? Okay, they've got that. Rafting? You want to have great food? You want to, you know... I mean, anything you want to do, they've, they've got it in Thailand, and um, it's been really a good place to be. So I, I love them all, and I think um, Vietnam is a special place in our heart. But I, but I think they're all they've all been great. Um. Oh wait, is this? Uh, oh, um, next question. What is it like to raise kids overseas? Yeah. Um, Fun and challenging, I would say. So the challenging part is that they're, they are far away from their family and, their, um, and they have to always make new friends every couple of years. So it's like being in a military family in a lot of ways. Like every two or three years, we move to a new city. They have to um, get into a new school, make new friends, sometimes get used to a new language. Um, and then, you know, the grandparents hate it because they don't get to see the grandkids very often. So we, we Skype a lot with my parents or with my wife's parents. Um, and we try to maintain those connections with uh, their families, with you know my brother and sister and their cousins and all this stuff. So that part is very challenging. Turns out in the technologically connected world that we're in now, it's a little bit easier, uh, but it's still hard. It's hard to be far away, but there are huge advantages. I mean, my kids, they they love food. They they eat anything. I mean, I, we took this trip to China a few years ago, and I got my my little one who was I think she was three at the time, and she's eating worms and uh, you know all different fish and squid and all these you know chicken feed and whatever. I mean, they just their minds are open to new experiences, and uh, they and it's all an adventure, and they're very flexible you know like they just they get up to speed when we're moving here to thailand my older one was like i was like oh you know you're gonna move to a new place um you're gonna have a new school here's what it's gonna look like she's like oh i can't wait to meet all my new friends you know i mean the attitude that's awesome you know here's an opportunity to get some new experiences to meet some new people um it does it's not all roses i think that you know kids uh can uh really suffer and and be challenged in this situation and feel like oh i'm always the new kid always gonna make new friends um, but so far you know knock on wood my, my kids have really thrived in this particular kind of environment it's been great i wonder on the topic of like racism i would imagine being like one if it was one of your kids the chances of them growing up and having a racial issue with someone as in them being racist your kids being racist i feel like having that experience like it, it almost nullifies that 
uh, I don't know, what are your thoughts on seeing certain people in the news be racist or how certain kids are raised in a, in a, in a semi-closed society because it's one type of race there? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think having more experiences, having more friends that look different ways, you know, really, really helps them be more sensitive to those issues and, and keeps them with an open mind. I mean, they've had friends on like, I don't know, four different continents, you know, that, you know, we have pictures of them in, uh, in Africa where, you know, they have a bunch of little African kids they're all playing with, they're all having a great time and got pictures of them in Manila where it's a whole bunch of, you know, little Filipino kids and they're having a great time. And, uh, I think it helps them to understand the, you know, there's people look all different ways and, uh, have all different backgrounds, but they can still, you know, kick a soccer ball around together or they can still play dress up together and it's still fun. And, and that there's actually benefits to that. It's not just okay, it's actually better to have all these different kinds of friends because they bring different things to the table. And it's, um, yeah, it's been good. And my, my kids, you know, are multicultural. My wife is half Japanese. And so they, um, you know, I, I think that they, 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 they look pretty Caucasian, but they have that personal um, background that helps, helps um, with them understanding, you know, people from different, um, ethnicities from different countries. And um, I think being multicultural yourself and then living in a very multicultural world help, just helps you to be more understanding and, um, and, and kind of look at the world as a place where people should be working together and learning about each other and, and benefiting from that. Yeah. I wonder what that would do to my mind in the sense of like, tr I guess to some degree, when I traveled to Vietnam or when I was in Sydney, when you step into an airplane and step out from one continent to another, you don't feel a difference, but you do, you do feel that culture difference. Like even in Australia, there's a, a statement that, uh, that I've heard where Australia culturally is 20 years behind America. Mm. Um, I kind of actually understood that once I went there, some of the, things that are said, some of the way that, that they, uh, how society, how they may say, um, say something, certain, even certain racial things that now that where I almost feel like you wouldn't say that now in America, but 20 years ago in America, you could hear someone say that mm -hmm. where back then we didn't really think that was wrong to say that. Um, so there's certain things when I went to Australia and I might get blasted online, online for saying this, but I, I'm not really, I I'm not saying anything bad about Australia. I, I loved being there. Actually, just today I was remembering how I love snorkeling there. It was probably the best snorkeling I've, I've ever had. Um, but it's interesting to fly in a plane and not almost feel how you don't get to feel how big the world is and how, how the population is so massive. Um, I wonder, I wonder if kids are able to pick that up, uh, I don't know. I'm just, it's just random thoughts, I guess. I don't really have, I'm, I don't have a direction with it. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that actually the interesting thing with Australia is that you probably land there, like you land in Sydney, you look around and it looks like California, you know, in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. I understand that, you know, how a place looks isn't necessarily the same as how, how it's situated culturally and, and in other ways. And so I think you're right that it's, Actually, really eye-opening to go somewhere and realize, wow, people look at the world differently in different places. They have different histories that affect, you know, uh, how how they'll, you know, what what their people are able to say and what they're not able to say. And I think that that's something like very uh, basically, like for me growing up, like I would I would never have thought of that. But the kids get exposure to that, and especially when they live somewhere for for a while, they're like, oh, well, it could look the same, but it could be totally different um, in yeah. cultural cultural way how's uh covid treating you in thailand and what's the covid situation like in thailand it's it's been really interesting so uh, we we moved here kind of i mean covid's been a big problem since march right and so we moved here in um july august and at that time uh thailand had only had something like 500 cases and 60 deaths or something like that, like a really, really small number compared to what was happening in the United States. And so we felt very lucky to be here. Um, 
the Thais had actually closed the border for the most part. We're not allowing uh, international travelers in for the most part. And so we had to go through a really like long quarantine process. We came here, we flew in, we had to have all these COVID tests. We quarantined in a hotel for two weeks before we were even allowed outside. And we got here and life was pretty normal for the most part. I mean, people wear masks around, but it's, um, uh, restaurants were open, you know, we could go to malls and, and uh, travel and stuff. Um, it's recently um, had a little bit of a resurgence here. So there's been an increase in number of cases over the last few weeks. And so things are kind of um, shutting down again. And uh, there's some restrictions on movement and restaurants and stuff like that. Um, but overall, I'd say that compared to when we were in Virginia last year, it's been uh, not, the COVID situation has not been as um, restrictive on our personal lifestyle. Like the kids were able to go to school uh, we were able to go into work, but it's all evolving. And it's, um, yeah, it's kind of like every day you wake up and check the news. I mean, it's just like the United States, wake up, check the news, see what, whatever the, the newest crazy thing is that you're going to have to deal with. Yeah. Um, how do you keep in contact with family and friends while overseas all the time? Yeah, we use a lot of um, regular Skype calls and, um, a lot of phone calls and stuff and Facebook. Um, I think the number one way that it's kind of funny, the number one way I feel like I know what's happening with my friends is like looking at Facebook just cause I can't, you know, be there and go to, go to social functions or, you know, um, go visit somebody's house or have play dates or whatever. So I, I get a lot of like my updates on my friends from Facebook, particularly since everybody's over all over the place. I mean, we've have friends that, from all the different assignments we've had overseas and then also in the United States and people that are in my job are, you know, always moving to different countries. So it's hard to like keep track of where they're at. So, you know, I'll, I'll look up on Facebook like, Oh, Lem's in, in Bulgaria now. I had no idea, you know, <laughs> Sally's in, uh, you know, Russia. Wow. That's interesting. I wonder what it's like there. So it's kind of fun. You know, we've, uh, you know, you see where somebody's at and, you know, message them and we do a lot of kind of, um, remote kind of keeping in touch with people. And then we try to call my folks like once a, once a week or once every two weeks and have them FaceTime with the kids just so they can see them. I don't want them to be in a situation yeah. where they don't talk to them in six months. They're like, oh my God, look, they're huge now. And they're totally cool. <laughs> like having that family connection is very important to me. And so we do, we do try to keep connected with people that way. And then the other thing that happens yeah. is people come and visit us. So the neat thing, I mean, pre COVID of course, was that wherever we are, it was an opportunity for somebody to travel somewhere where they hadn't been before. So like when we were living in Zimbabwe, like we're talking about very few people could even find that on a map. And so my folks came out, my wife's folks came out, you know, they'd come and stay with us for a few weeks and get a chance to travel around and meet our friends, see what we did. And uh, that, that has been really fun to, and then our, our friends come in to the extent they can come visit us. And we expected a bunch of people to come visit us here in Thailand because it's such a, great tourist spot, but just because of COVID and stuff, it's been hard. Yeah. 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 COVID's really fucking up everything. Yeah. It's tough for everybody. Uh, there was a question here from one. Uh, are, uh, so this is related to your, I think the embassy in Bangkok. Are the, are the U S Marines still playing basketball with the high schoolers and the DEA agents at the old embassy compound compound in Bangkok? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. That's, uh, so this, this person, they, um, I want to say it was probably about 20 years ago. Their parents, uh, his parents were, was in the military, um, or contracted some, so the, his, his parents moved to Thailand for, uh, three or four years and, and he was watching, I guess, that situation where there was Marines and DEA agents playing basketball with high schoolers. Got it. Okay. Yeah, well, so uh, Bangkok is one of our largest embassies in the world. And we have um, people that work for the State Department like me that are here. And then we also have tons and tons of different agencies here um, that are uh, doing all different kinds of things. I mean, it's really amazing. You have people from the Department of Agriculture that are here that are you know, looking at agricultural trade or, you know, you've got people from the um, U.S. Trade and Development Agency that are here that are looking to help, you know, American businesses um, and American companies uh, solidify deals here and that are going to, you know, benefit the American economy. You've got 
um, military folks that are here that are dual, and we have very, very strong military collaboration with, with Thailand. So huge, huge number of people. Um, I imagine the, the scene that your, your friend is talking about where you have, you know, people from different backgrounds playing with high school kids and stuff still, still is the case here. And it's funny, it's such a big place that, you know, I, I don't know a large percentage of the people that are here, but um, yeah, we're yeah. A big, a presence that kind of reflects our strong collaborative relationship with, with Thailand here. And um, we do have Marines, you mentioned Marines and actually Marines, uh, we have a Marine security guard that uh, protects all of our various uh, embassies around the world. And we're very lucky to have these folks that are here and Anytime you, there's a big incident, you know, one of the attacks that we talked about earlier, you know, those they're, they're the people that are, are here and really on the front line. And so we are we are thankful to have uh, folks like that here as well in Thailand. Yeah. Um, what is a, a universal thing of all the countries that you've been to? Do you think that they should learn from each other? Yeah, I, I think. I, I don't know. I think the thing that I like the most about um, all the different places we've been is um, how people are so proud of their culture in different ways and how they celebrate it in different ways. And, and I think that's kind of the, the most amazing thing um, that would be great for people to learn from each other. Like I, I'm thinking about when we were in, in Zimbabwe, they had this, like here's a place that I was talking about, it has all these political and economic challenges, but every year they would have this um, international festival where they, they would have music and art and um, all these like artists would come together for like a multi-day thing that would happen in the capital. And you could go and just see people, not only from Zimbabwe, but from other countries, they're all celebrating their, their um, culture and their art uh, and music together. And I, and you know, I kind of compare that to like when we are in Bangladesh, they have like their um, have a really strong history of culture and music and art and, um, They'd have every day they'd celebrate their mother tongue, their language day, and and have kind of festivals that were or uh, events that were focused around celebrating language and and writing and poetry and things like that. And so, I I really enjoy in each of the countries seeing how uh, culture and art and music and language are celebrated, and uh, I think that's it's neat for countries to be able to compare how it's been done in different places and. It's actually one of the things that we do um, through the State Department. Well, there's a section in our State Department that um, focuses on cultural exchanges. And I, I think that's one of the coolest things that you, you bring people together from different places and you um, get them together and you get them talking about um, what they value and what they think is important and, and you build those kind of connections and then people will, will maintain those connections uh, over many years, you know, and, and, and share their ideas. And I, it's, it's one of the coolest things to see happen. And it's something that I'm happy that we're able to help facilitate, um, kind of in, in the role that I'm in as well. Did you get to experience the, um, the Vietnamese, uh, new year, the, that? Yes, of course. Yeah. Oh, it was wonderful. I, I, love, Did- I have these great memories of, uh, being in Ho Chi Minh city, you know, and the, uh, they closed down some of the streets like uh, Ham Nhi, I think, one of the big streets near where we were, and they'd have these big displays and all these flowers, you know, yellow flowers, and um, you'd hear the music and the uh, and see all the kind of uh, the festive atmosphere, I guess, there. And yeah, I mean, that's what another great example of kind of this celebration of culture and, and history. Oh man, yeah, great. Yeah, when they spend an, like some of them, I don't, I actually, do, I've, I don't think I, you know, I haven't been able to experience it yet, uh, but I hear that they do an entire week of just partying. Um, did you get to kind of experience it that way or were you, um, did you have to get to work? Yeah, no, we, we, we experienced that. They, they usually, um, when we're overseas, so there's like a cap on the number of holidays that we can get each year. So we get like American holidays, like we'll get 4th of July off or Christmas or whatever. And then we usually we get like some number of um, local holidays as well. And so um, during Tet, that's um, usually, yeah, like your government um, contacts and stuff, we'll get a longer period, like a week or, or longer. Oh, okay. Off. And then we'll, we, we don't usually get like quite as many days off, but we'll get a few days off. And it's like people travel or, um, yeah, go and celebrate, you know, go to these parties and stuff. 
So yeah, we did get to celebrate that. And um, one time we traveled up north and had like a kind of got to experience the how Tet was up up in the northern part of Vietnam. And then one year we were down south and uh, around Ho Chi Minh City. So it was fun to compare and see how it was different in different places. Yeah, nice. Did you ever interview for U.S. visa applicants? So as as at, at an embassy, and then what were automatic red flags that you looked for? Yeah, uh, um, so good question. I think uh, just to say that I think that uh, visa questions are probably like when people find out that I work for um, I work in an embassy overseas. That's probably the number one thing people ask about because it's just. Uh, there's a lot of interest. I think there's a lot of mystery about, uh, or people people don't always understand the decision making process for how visas are granted and how they're not. So uh, I did um, do um, every every foreign service officer does um, consular work uh, in their career, and I, I did that in the Philippines. So I did interview for um, non-immigrant visa applicants, people that wanted to come to the United States for. Um, for tourism, for business, um, for temporary stays, right? And um, part of the question about like, were there automatic red flags? Because really um, what any person who's working in that field will tell you is that there's each each application is different and it's really the totality of that person and their their personal history and their travel and the reason that they're traveling. It all It all goes into the hopper in terms of kind of trying to understand whether they qualify for a visa or not. And the person that's in that job is um, is comparing the person's situation to the legal requirements, you know, that's written out in law and regulation or why, whether they qualify for the visa or not. So, yeah, I, I don't, I, I couldn't point to a single red flag um, and it's not an area that I'm working in right now. Um, but I, I think that the main thing to know is that there's kind of like legal requirements in the law and that the um, consular officer is is trying to compare the whole case to that law and that the more information that the applicant shares and is able to explain their their legitimate reason for travel and and everything in their case um, the the better their chances will, would be and that often I think people are worried about sharing particular details and I think that um, lack of transparency in terms of interview is probably something that doesn't benefit I, I would I would guess um, but like I said I any I don't um, I couldn't speak on any kind of official way about the visa process and um, it's it's really different in different different countries different applicants um, in each different scenario is it would it or is there any crazy stories that you can talk about or I'm guessing since it's kind of more uh, those applications are private so you may can, can you even talk about them like is there a crazy story yeah that, i um no i really can't because those are yeah they're kind of they're private conversations and um yeah okay no problem and unfortunately there it's, it's it's really there's there are a lot of interesting things and you can imagine the full reason range of reasons that people might want to go to the united states there's medical emergencies there's really interesting cultural exchanges, there's really interesting business opportunities, like all kinds of stuff. Um, but um, yeah, the details of particular cases aren't something that um, consular officers generally can share publicly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, uh, what place would you like to travel to that you haven't yet and why? Oh man, that is such a good question. And it's actually, it's kind of the, the hobby that my wife and I have is we, Kind of look at the globe and try to figure out <laughs> where we're gonna go and i uh we have not explored for whatever reason um we've we spent most of our time in asia and then um and then kind of a little bit in africa a little bit in south america um i think the two parts of the world that we haven't explored so much are kind of europe and um and then certain parts of of south america so yeah, I, I think that in terms of like a region that I want to explore, I want to go, like I'd love to go to Europe and I've never been to like Northern Europe and Norway and Sweden and stuff. I think it'd be cool to go and check that out, see the Northern Lights or whatever. Um, but actually, I think the number one place that I really want to go that I haven't been yet, and I think it's, um, 
has potential to really change is Madagascar, which is an island off of Africa in the um, Indian Ocean, kind of in the southern eastern part of the continent. And um, they have, you know, that's where lemurs come from, right? You see Madagascar, you have lemurs and stuff, and these mm -hmm. uh, amazing animals, uh, amazing plants that are really unique to that island. And um, because of deforestation, because of a lot of different reasons, it's um, changing quickly. And uh, I, I think it would be such a cool place to go uh, see. It's, it's hard to get to. It's um, the infrastructure there is um, not always the best. And so it's a little bit hard to travel around. But uh, man, I think it'd be really fun to go check out. For your kind of your career path, starting it out, uh, do you, if someone asked, how do I become a diplomat? Would you suggest that same exact route that you went or would you suggest something different? Yeah, I think people do it all different kinds of ways, right? So people, um, so, so the process for becoming a diplomat is that you just have to take this test, right? And you, if you pass the test, then you get to be a foreign service officer and you get all the training and stuff. There's no requirement to have a particular kind of degree. There's no particular requirement to have worked in a certain kind of job. You know, you could be uh, a person that works in retail and um, has never studied foreign policy, but if you can pass the test, then you can become a foreign service officer. And in fact, I think that our uh, foreign service benefits from having people from diverse backgrounds because they bring different perspectives, they bring different ideas. Um, it's really great to have a diverse group of people that are there. So. My, my role, my process was, you know, I, I went to college, I studied something that was not foreign policy, but um, I studied kind of environmental stuff, um, economic stuff. And then I worked in the private sector for a few years doing that environmental stuff, economic stuff. And then I, and then I got into the foreign service and now I'm doing that, that kind of thing, environmental stuff, economic stuff. But I don't, the, no way I don't think is that required. And I, I think that if people like the idea of being overseas and doing this kind of work, signing up and taking the test is um, is great, and you should do it as as soon as you can. Um, but I but I think one thing to know is that people often like the allure of being overseas. They like the idea of like this. You know, they've seen movies like, "Oh, I'm gonna be like you know, 007, living overseas, doing this. You know, going to receptions and." putting on my tuxedo and talking to the prime minister and it all sounds very exciting. And then um, they get into the actual job and it's like moving a lot. It's always kind of feeling a little bit off kilter because you're learning a new language and you learn about a new country, learn a new job. And, and it's, they find out it's not for them. So I think that, you know, sometimes getting a little bit of life experience in like terms of what you like and what you're good at helps before you, you take on a career that's um, like foreign service that's very challenging. But um, I can see it, I guess, long story short, I can see it happening both ways, like doing it early in your career when you want to get out there and you've got energy and it sounds really exciting. Or, or we get a lot of people that do it as their second or, or even third careers. Like they've gone, they've been an investment banker in New York. They made whatever, a pile of money. They got burned out. And they're like, now I want to do something different. And they join the Foreign Service and um, have a different, totally different kind of life. Yeah, I would imagine that, uh, when you, you mentioned about being off kilter, I, uh, say, say working in an office job where you're in a cubicle, I see certain people where they, they just get set in a routine. They, they got their specific coffee mug. It almost feels there's, they don't want to be thrown off in their routine at all. I see certain subtleties where anything that changes in their routine, they're just, um, flustered per se or or it takes a, a they have a certain type of personality or comfort level where i think when i went to vietnam for six months i went to sydney for four months um i would guess i'm guessing that i would have a little bit more um of a comfort level being in different countries um than the average american i'm guessing i'm guessing um yeah, I think I think most I, I would guess most people want to have that comfort level of having 
a place they call home and they're going to go there every day. They have access to it where if, if you're a diplomat getting moved around, um, I guess that, that comfort level isn't the same all the time. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's really, it requires like exactly what you said. I think it requires like a specific kind of person that's uh, going to be okay with that. You know, like they're, they're not going to be comfortable, but they're going to be okay with it. And it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. really different. And you know, not only being in different places and doing kinds of work, but like kind of having to figure things out on your own. Cause there's not, there's not like a good guide for like, it's not like you sit down at your desk and you're like, okay, here's the 101 for how to do your job necessarily. Like you kind of got to figure it out and figure out how, how are you going to develop connections with people and how are you going to, you know, uh, focus on issues that are most important. And it's, um, it's fun in a lot of ways because because there's no like specific guide, you have a lot of latitude for doing your job in different kinds of ways. And so I think some people are excited by that idea. And it's like, okay, well, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna have a different coffee cup every day. I'm gonna have a different kind of office every day. I'm gonna have a different kind of work function every day. And that's an opportunity for me to grow and, and do things that are exciting and new. And then I think other people might look at that and be like, oh my God, that sounds terrible. It's really scary and difficult. And what if I don't know the right thing to say? What if I don't, what if I fail at this? It's uh, it's it's kind of um, stressful in in that kind of way. So, I think yeah. you know, it's yeah. just like a personality thing. Yeah, yeah. I I find that I when I get interested in something, whether it be a YouTube uh, recording series, I knew nothing about photography, f stops, ISO, um, all this aperture, all this stuff. My, um, the the video editing software, the microphones, everything. Uh, when I got into it, I had n no idea. I literally started just filming stuff, and I told myself, I was like, you know what? The first six months is probably just going to be crap. Like, I'm going to produce crap, but I'm just going to try it, and you, you don't know where I'll go. I feel like I'm, I got kind of a, a rhythm now. It took, it took me a, a few months more than I wanted. I, I wanted to start this a little bit earlier, but that's the nature of starting something new. Um, another uh, side story connected with that. It's I, I I've been a programmer for um, sixteen years. Oh wow! And then um, about four years ago, I discovered cryptocurrency. Um, yeah. And it, it it may to me to me it was such a different ballpark. Uh, programming. I'm I learn a language. I I get specs from management. I program it. Cryptocurrency uses this this RSA encryption, and I hadn't I didn't know much. I, I sadly didn't know much about it. So I had a friend that just uh, won one at some um, be, uh, pool party. He came up and said, "Hey, what do you know about cryptocurrency?" At that day, I I, I didn't really know much. I was like, you know, "Like Bitcoin," and he's uh, "Yeah, there's this other one called Ethereum. Why don't you check it out?" I knew he was a, a pretty high up uh, tech position at some company, so I was kind of I was kind of thinking maybe I should check this out or something. I went home that day, started researching, and I I started understanding like the fundamentals of RSA encryption, which this is all built on. And a light bulb went off, and I'm like, "Holy shit! This is amazing technology! Oh my gosh! This is like this almost feels like the pinnacle of the internet, like." the everything that the internet was has built up to this this is the the technology that 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 could revolutionize the world um rsa encryption what that does um it allows a it allows a truth factor from consensus so if you don't if you don't know if, if sally sent david five bitcoin this network through mathematical ways sends a signature that says this machine validated that transaction because that machine does know Sally or Dave who gave Sally that Dave has five coins to give Sally right. and it signs that mathematically and then the other computers that on that network said yep that looks right too and it is very very tough to crack and it hasn't been cracked yet it hasn't been hacked um, and to to not even hack it to overtake the system, you need anywhere between thirty to seventy percent of the of all the 
servers in the world to overtake it. So you as one person, if there, I don't know how many servers there are around the world, I'm going to say maybe like 4 million servers, you have to build like 2 million servers, probably, probably more than 2 million servers. You have to build, let's just say 3 million servers, put it online, and then you could try to hack the system and take over the system. But it's it's an amazing technology. Anyway, sorry, I went on a total tangent. Um, it's, it's funny because I think people get scared because it seems so technical, and they're like, "It is." Oh, I don't know, it like is. RSA encryption, whatever. But when you get down to like the, I've had it explained to me in like a more kind of layman way before, and it's like, "Oh, okay, I can like wrap my mind around that." And I, I mean, I think it's, I think the use of blockchain technology for other things, you know, is is fascinating you just like look at how many different applications it could have and um takes away the need for like a central authority for things it's just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know it's really my yeah 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 so uh yeah four four or five years ago someone told me about it i it's it's crazy because i actually started thinking just the other day i was like i think i heard of bitcoin during the white paper in 2008 and back then as a programmer I, I couldn't put my mind to figure out how they would do it. So I told my coworkers, they, they asked me, hey, what do you think about Bitcoin? I'm like, I don't know anything about it. There's no way anybody could build a security system like that. There's no way. Mm -hmm. And then 2016, 2000, I think it's 2016, I was, that friend that told me, hey, what do you think about Ethereum and Bitcoin? I went home, researched it, and I've gotten to the weeds of how does RSA encryption work? There's two primary keys. You do all this math. And then you get these two private public keys and that everything is hashed against uh, that public key and only the private key could uh, um, could decrypt it. And my mind was blown. I was like, I understand this stuff. It's freaking crazy. Wow. But as a programmer, I guess that's not as much of a... I was going to try to connect it with, you, with uh, being a diplomat and having to be a jack of all trades. I guess being a programmer, I was just writing code. When I had to research RSA, that was that was math. That was like understanding pri two primary numbers, multiplying all this modular, this. I, I, I don't even know all the terminology, but I was able to watch a, uh, I forget, it was like an hour video, understand that, read a bunch of other papers. And then I was like, I get this. And um so I think it takes like uh, a certain person where you want to learn and you have the willingness to go out and and research and learn more. Um, that's what I, I'm 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 really amazed when you you mentioned that about uh, being a diplomat. Like I if if you would have asked me uh, two hours ago, I would assume oh they probably just do a bunch of paperwork. That I mean, there's probably not too much to it. <laughs> but um, it's it sounds like you have to do you have to be a jack of all trades and importantly be able to learn a new trade as you go. Right, right. And there's kind of, there are resources for it, you know, for you to be able to learn those things and get get the knowledge you need to do your job, but it requires a lot of effort and like willingness to learn. Like one of the things that I work on a lot, like probably over half of what I do here in Thailand right now is focus on energy. And um, I, you know, I have a degree in uh, environmental science and I have pretty good understanding of stuff, but like the technical like ins and outs of the oil and gas industry and what company, what different kind of companies do and what a regulatory environment looks like and all that stuff. Like a lot of that was pretty new stuff to me. And so I had to, while I was doing my job here, I was taking basically a night class and well, offered in the day in the United States, but nighttime for me. So I do my job, you know, whatever, nine to five here. And then I get home, I'd have dinner and then I'd for like, three or four hours in the evening, I'd be listening to seminars and talking to experts in the wow. United States, uh, both government folks and from the private sector, learning about the oil and gas industry and, and kind of the latest on regulations and um, technology and all these different things. Like some of it very technical, you know, like new new stuff for me and uh, taking a lot of notes. And so it's, um, then I, you know, wake up the next morning and I'd apply that knowledge in my day-to-day -day conversation. So it's really like a lot of learning on the fly. Um, and in some ways it was a lot of work and, and hard. And, you know, I, I didn't sleep a lot for those, you know, few weeks that I was doing that, but it's also really exciting. And it's fun to like, I think when you're in like high school, especially and, and to some extent in college, like you're learning this stuff and you don't know why you're learning it. 
I'm like, oh, okay, I'll sit in this class. Like, I guess it's interesting to learn about whatever ancient Grecian history or whatever, but am I ever going to really use this? The, the kind of functional training that I've been getting in my job here is great because it's like, I really want to know these things because I know tomorrow I'm going to have a conversation about it and I want to have as good an understanding as I can. So I just, it, it, I'm so motivated to learn these things and to um, get smarter on it because it's A, fun, and B, it's going to help me with my job. And that's been fun in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. There's an online question, which I, at the time I understood it, right now I don't, but uh, I'm going to just ask and see if you understand what they're going at. Uh, what is there, what is your perception of America, especially that are in support of democratic socialism, oh, as they have experienced firsthand communism, uh, uh, i.e. living in Vietnam? Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing this question. I, th I think... And if I understand the question right, it's kind of like there are um, there are people in the United States that are have a kind of different uh, philosophical leanings, right? And like democratic socialism is one that's been in the news a lot. And then overseas, there are countries that are uh, are communist. You know, like uh, yeah, I, I think you're you're the way you perceive the question. That's how I perceive it. Yeah, yeah. and so I think it's um, when I was when I was living in Vietnam, which is a uh, you know one party communist country. Um, People looked to the United States and I think um, saw it as a very diverse place with a lot of different kinds of people with a lot of different kinds of backgrounds. And I think that that was something the the people, you know, kind of in an unofficial way, the people that I interacted with um, seemed to appreciate that, you know, and it was, um, yeah, I think seen as a source of strength. And actually in a lot of countries I've been in, that have different kinds of government systems um, have appreciated the United States is diverse and that there are people from different backgrounds and different philosophical leanings who are able to share their ideas and that it all, it all seems to work pretty well. I, I think the other thing that's kind of interesting to think about is that not only the United States is really diverse, like even a place like Vietnam that is a, you know, uh, has a certain kind of political system, it's, it doesn't necessarily conform to the textbook. I mean, there's a lot of free market capitalism that's happening in Vietnam, even though it's, you know, overall like a, a communist state. So I, I think it's hard when you look at these categories to like fit countries into them. Um, um, but the, the overall message that I've received from people, both in my kind of official and unofficial uh, role overseas has been that, you know, the United States and its diversity uh, and in culture, but also diversity in thought and, and politics is something that people see to be its strength. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who do you keep up in touch with from high school? Uh, not as many people as I wish I would, I guess, is the best answer. I yeah, no, I, I think, uh, I think just through Facebook, there may be I think one or two people that I've messaged uh, that I message from time to time, but as for actually physically uh, hanging out with a high school friend, I think it's been the last person was uh, uh, eleven years ago was the last time. Wow. Um, yeah, I actually sent um, a message to uh, Madhu. Do you remember Madhu? I do. Yeah. I sent a message to see if he he wants to do a conversation. Um, uh, Jordan, um, uh, I probably shouldn't say the last name. Uh, so, well, oh, I'll, I'll cut it out in the video. Um, uh, who was the other person that I? Uh, th those are the two that I remember off the top of my head. Um, ra random thought: Do you think there's anybody that um, that you know of that? Um, that should do a conversation with me. And if you do, just say their first name and then uh, we'll, we'll, I'll put it in the video and then we'll, we'll figure out a way to call them out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh man, I um, gotta think about that. Cause there's a lot of people in high school that I'd love to know more about what they're doing these days and you know, what their life's like. If, even if you want to call out any friends that you have or anybody that you've worked with that uh, you think would uh, enjoy this type of format, this conversation, that even I don't have to know them, but if you just want to call them out. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, first, so I think Madhu would be great because uh, he's 
a genius and doing exciting things and has like the most exciting life that I can imagine. So yeah, I think he's, he'd be a great one. I definitely agree on that. Um, I don't think of like other people that I'm, I don't know. I'm kind of blanking on it. I have to think. Uh, that's fine. I'll ask you another question. And if you think about, uh, if you think about anything, we can come jump back to that one. Okay. Uh, what, what current passion do you have as in a side hobby or even just a, just something that you, you, that keeps you up at night, things you think about things that you work on, or it doesn't have to be actual work, just, a anything. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I kind of see those as two different questions. So for hobbies and stuff. So I, I really like, so I love travel. I think that's like the number one thing that we do and spend all our money on and like whatever tiny place that, you know, has never been to before, you know, we, we, we want to go to wherever we can and explore as much as we can and get really, really far off the beaten track. And Wait, so you're telling me you get to travel around the world as a diplomat and then you still spend all your money, like, are you saying you, you travel that whole country that you're in or you even, while you're there as a diplomat, uh, uh, say, say you're working, so you're in Thailand right now, right. you'll also spend money to go to, um, uh, to Japan, someplace you haven't been yet. Right. So you, is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, exactly. And I think that the cool thing is when we were living in the United States, I would, you know, spend a lot of money getting overseas to another location and then traveling around. And now that we, every couple of years, we have a different home base, we get to travel around the region, right? So when we're in Thailand, we've got great access to, you know, pre-COVID or whatever, we get to great access to Cambodia and Laos and Burma and Malaysia and like, super cheap to travel to all those different places. And then, you know, when we were in Southern Africa, we could take road trips or travel all around the, the African continent. And so, yes, I think it has made it even more of a push for us to get out and travel being in these different locations. Cause we're like, shoot, we only got two or three years to, you know, see as much as we can. Who knows when we're going to be back to Southern Africa. Right. So that is like, wow. and my, my wife in particular is a really good planner. So she's, she puts together all the trips and like, you know, sets up the itineraries and we, we just go, we, we drag the kids along and um, we spend, like when we moved to Vietnam, I think we must have gone 50 out of 52 weekends of the year, just traveling within the country. You know, we just take road trips, oh, little villages, we'd go wherever we could. We, we marked off all the, the, you know, big, big name tourist spots, but then we started going next tier, second tier, third tier, like what are all the different places we can go? And I think that's that I think that is my number one passion and I just I love food I love music I love talk I'm, I'm a talker I love talking to people and uh yeah travel's been really like the number one passion or hobby and things that we think that we I think that I think about at night that I get really excited about really gets me through the day and it's fun to have a career where it's like that passion is something that goes hand in hand with what I'm doing in my day-to-day -day job right that's crazy that you, you said travel 50 out of 52 weeks. Well, we traveled oh. so much. I mean, we had like zero savings, you know, we were just. Like, <laughs> oh, well, that's so like, awesome. That, yeah. I, that, that I, it's so awesome in the sense of I'm thinking as I, as you're talking to me and I'm thinking, man, why didn't someone tell me to become a diplomat? Like I could have traveled to so many places. And then my train of thought is like, okay, if they would have sent me to Zimbabwe, I would have been in Zimbabwe. I would have just explored Zimbabwe a little bit. But you're telling me like you, you went through all of South Africa, the, the South Southern region of Africa, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. while you're in Zimbabwe. That's, that's amazing. That's makes me even more jealous. That's awesome. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, it's just great. It's like, uh, it's great to love what you're doing in your day to day job and your work, and then also get a chance to like, translate that over to your personal life too. So it's been fun. And I think that, you know, yeah, I, my struggle has been to balance like all the things I love doing. Like I love travel and I love food and love music, you know, and getting out to live shows and, and um, new restaurants and stuff like that. And then, you know, also I'm trying to like, uh, live in the good life, you know, you get fat. Like I need, I need to get out and exercise. <laughs> so, making time that's like been my new red year's resolution is to try to you know exercise more regularly and get out and like you were saying you know i had i've done some running and stuff in the past and i've done a handful of marathons but i want to try to get out and do more of that here and there's there's all kinds of local stuff that you can sign up for 
I got a nice park near my house where I can run. So I'm trying to get, get out and do more of that. The, uh, I wonder to what degree, why, uh, being, a uh, why being a diplomat is le lesser known in the sense of the way, I guess the way I'm hearing your story, it sounds freaking amazing. Um, I wonder why I've never heard of someone saying, Hey, uh, they're going to become a diplomat or, Hey, you should go to school to get into this degree and try to become a diplomat. Like, I don't think I've ever heard anything someone promote being a diplomat. Yeah. I, I, I don't know why. I, I feel the exact same way. Like when I discovered this, when my wife signed up for it, like, what are we doing? Moving overseas and who are we working for? And it's like the U S government, like, for whatever reason, I think that the, the State Department um, could improve its like uh, awareness. Advertising. Right? And it's, and it's like, okay. I don't know, maybe just it's like this small place where we went to high school. It's just an off the beaten track. Maybe if we were at a fancy school that was like in the center of San Diego or something that they would be more aware of that. But for whatever reason, um, that knowledge of that career doesn't seem to be getting out as much. And they do have like there's something called a hometown diplomat program that is the State Department uh, tries to get people to go back to wherever they're from and tell people about what they do just to build awareness about it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's another like in the headquarters building that we have that's down in Washington, D.C. They have like a museum that they're setting up that's supposed to like talk a little more about diplomacy and our history of doing it. But I think fundamentally the issue is that the people that do this job, there's a relatively few number. There's 8,000 of us that are overseas. And it's, um, you know, you compare that to like the military with like millions and millions of people, like the chances that somebody are gonna know somebody that does this job, it's pretty small, right? 8,000 yeah, yeah. people in the United yeah. States, um, you might not run across somebody from your high school who's like, oh yeah, hey, I'm doing this weird thing. It's called being a foreign service officer working in an embassy overseas. It's just the chances of that knowledge spreading is a lot lower. So yeah, that's why I try to like tell people about it. And I, I kind of discovered it a few years after college and I'm really like, cannot imagine a more fun career. And I, I feel like I want to, I feel obligated to tell other people like, oh my God, this is the thing you could do that I never even knew existed before. The, uh, the, the, where you mentioned every two or three years, uh, you have to get some, uh, you have to get promoted to stay in. You have to, is that, it's every two or three years you change your um, assignment. Usually you go either to another country overseas or you'll go back to Washington DC and work there. Um, but there's like a schedule of promotion where you have to like every X number of years, you have to move up um, to a, a higher level in the system. So they have like, um, yeah, it's basically, if you don't get promoted um, to the next level in that prescribed time frame, and it depends on what level you're at, let's say it's like in 10 years, you don't move up to the next level, then um, then you have to leave the department. So it's, uh, they call it an up hmm. or out system. It Does that sound more ominous than it is per, uh, perhaps? Yeah, I think so. I think that like people generally, generally get promoted and move up. And it's more like people, I think at the upper levels have more challenge with it. Like you can only be at like this kind of upper threshold for a certain amount of time. And if you, if you don't get promoted at that upper level, then, then you have to leave. But it's similar actually to a military system. Like a lot of people get stuck at the colonel level and there's like a huge number of colonels and getting like to the next level is, is hard sometimes. And so people just get, get stuck there. So it's, it's kind of like that, I think. Is there a, uh, like, is it uh, like military, if you work there for 20 years, uh, there's like a pension or something? Yeah, yeah there's same, same kind of thing. You work there and it's actually, uh, similar to other governments, if you've done prior government service, uh, that those years translate over to. So you get your pension after 20 years of government service. Like if you were Navy for 20, 10 years and you worked as a foreign service officer for 10 years, I think then you would get your full pension or whatever. Yeah. So on the uh, on the final questions, I I didn't put in the document that you uh, that's something that I asked you and then you don't have to answer on the. So you wrote your answer, but I'm gonna. Get, uh, I guess have you answer it. Um, so, uh, the first one: What is at a global or what at, at a global and national level? What do you think is the biggest problem for humans, and what should they do to mitigate it? Yeah, and so many hard to choose, right? But I think that 
on the on the national level, um, the thing that seems like, especially in the last few days, it's been a big problem is just uh, political divisiveness and and people not being able to see eye to eye and have conversations about their different opinions. And I just, it's sad, you know, I have on my Facebook feed, you know, I've got friends that have different opinions and there's a lot of people going back and forth. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's something that I feel, especially when I'm overseas and people ask me about it, um, say, you know, what's happening in America? It seems like there's this big problem. And um, I, I think that we all have to kind of come together and figure out a way for people to be able to have conversations, have friends who have different opinions, um, you know, I had a, in one of my assignments, um, previously I sat, my desk was next to a person that had a different political viewpoint than the one that I had. And we would, we would read the news overnight. We come to work in the morning and we'd have like a really productive conversation back and forth, like exchanging viewpoints and talking about like why we believe what we believed. And, you know, he and I would have really heated conversations, but we were, we respected each other. We were really good friends. And I feel like getting to a place in our country where we can do that um, would be, it, it seems like it's the right way to go and it's where we really need to get to. And I, I don't know, I don't have a solution for that, like how we get to that, but I, I hope that we can figure out a way to make it happen. And It's probably a really complicated solution. So that's the national one. And I think that for global stuff, um, climate change, I mean, I've, I've come from an environmental background, but you know, I've, been overseas and um, you know I've talked to a lot of different people and climate change has very very real effects and a place like DACA you know they're going to be 70% um, of their country is going to be underwater by you know in the next hundred years or whatever and so I think it's it is a a very real very pressing challenge and I think that for us especially for Americans uh, it can be a real opportunity for us to lend our innovation our kind of historic ability to find solutions to problems and I see this as a real opportunity for leadership and you know promoting american companies and american businesses that are coming up with low carbon technologies energy efficient technologies and and make that you know uh, a legacy of the united states uh, worldwide and that you know, we help address this challenge that we're all facing together yeah to add, uh, to add to that i i'm going to call out my friend um uh, he'll probably listen to this um so this is my side of the story if you're, if you're watching. Um, and your side of the story might be different. So he, uh, he was a bartender in Las Vegas. Prior to him becoming like a bartender, um, I remember having a conversation. I don't remember exactly what we said, but I remember mentioning climate change. And I was like, man, I watch a lot of documentaries. I, I wish humans and the government would do something more. I don't, I don't have an answer. I'm just... The things that I see going on, it just seems like there's not enough emphasis, not enough effort going on to preventing uh, what humans are doing to the planet. And at that time, I, the way I remember him replying, he was like, yeah, it's not that bad. So I was like, I was kind of, uh, I remember being emotionally like, uh, just I didn't agree with it, the way he said that, you know. So then a few years later, he became, he, he worked, he, or he became a bartender for a few years and one day he said it just came out of nowhere and he mentioned yeah this climate change stuff uh we need to do something about it i'm like wait what mm -hmm. well why why this change of heart uh, and then he's like well i get customers around the world coming to my bar and i get like a fisherman from from uh some other state uh, far away from here and and then that fisherman will just, you know, they come in, these clients, they'll, they'll have a few drinks, they get loose, and they may, may, may not even need a few drinks to mention this, but then that fisherman was saying, yeah, man, after 15 years ago or 30 years ago when I started fishing, we would pull in giant, giant um, pools of fish um, in the nets, but nowadays it's, it's like nothing. It's nothing compared to what, what it was back then. Um, so, but then he had my... Uh, the bartender he my friend he had other stories and i was like wow that that is it that is a it was an interesting way to think about climate change through hearing people's working stories being in the field or being in that environment and seeing the change yeah yeah I think that's right and it becomes not like an abstract thing where you're like oh there's oh one yeah political side or the other you're like dang my life is different because of this thing that's happening yeah yeah um, 
What do you find interesting about Vietnamese culture? Yeah, a lot. Uh, I think uh, I think one of my favorite things about Vietnamese culture is uh, people's entrepreneurial spirit. Like, I think that I, I mean, there's two things. I think one is that the um, we talked about like the community cohesiveness and the idea that you know everybody's kind of there's this idea that you address things together and that you know for better or worse everybody's in uh, in each other's business. But I think the other really exciting thing and interesting thing to me is um, how people are, there's a service to be provided and a, and a profit maybe that could be made that people, there is going to be somebody that's going to fill that role, you know, and like, I just, I was so always so amazed that in Vietnam, how people would, you know, have these little small businesses um, for everything, you know, for whatever possible service or, or need you might have, there's always somebody that's like thought of that and is willing to provide that service and help you out. And, and, it, and it's just, I don't know, it's amazing. I think there's, it requires a lot of creativity, a lot of uh, guts, a lot of kind of um, just getting out there and, and, and working and filling gaps that, that you see. And so, and I think that's both, you know, at a, at a kind of, um, walking down the street in Ho Chi Minh City kind of thing where there's somebody who's willing to you know deliver a drink to you to your office because you know you're too lazy to walk yourself down to the drink store but I think it's also at like a big company uh, startup kind of thing you know and that you know you see these uh, companies in the United States that are started by um, uh, Vietnamese immigrants or, or other folks from the immigrant community and it's just that that drive that entrepreneurial spirit is something that's really alive and I, I I like that a lot. I, I appreciate that a lot about Vietnamese culture. I I don't huh, I don't know if this is a dark road I take it down. Um and I do mean it in a positive light. Um when I see Viet, when I talk to uh, Vietnamese people and the young people especially, it's almost as if they are they know that they have to work to provide for their family, their mom and dad eventually. And there's a drive that I, I don't find in America. And maybe, um, maybe that's because in America we have the, like, when you're 18 years old, like, get out of the house. And not, not that that's really exactly how parents kick their kids out, but maybe it's subconsciously there and it causes people to know that their kids want are probably going to move out around the age of 18 or something or the rebellious kids know that they're at the age of 18 they're going to rebel um so for the vietnam side of that uh, maybe they can't rebel because of the cultural um backlash that the the, the, the family backlash yeah. that would happen um so I think, yeah, it's a difficult, I, I want to, when I say that they have this drive to work, I see like what you're saying, it's, it is, it's almost, in, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's, uh, it like touches my heart when I see that. I'm, when I, so I'm here in privileged America. I have a good job. I make a good salary. And then I see them working so hard for how much they make. And I'm like, gosh, I, their drive is much stronger than mine. If they were in my shoes, they'd be work, working more, making more money. I complain about, I complain about my 30 minute drive to work. I complain about, um, every, I, I'm a first world complainer. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I don't, yeah, I, I don't mean it to be dark, as in maybe Vietnam, because they come from, at least their generation now came from harder times, or it's only one generation away from the hard times, that their drive is so strong. Um, maybe I'll turn around on me. I feel lazy compared to when I look at them. So I'm like, what's wrong with me? I'm a freaking, uh, I, I was born in america i have this opportunity to make so much money why don't i work even harder to make more money um because that's what those people would be doing so it's um i don't know i'm not it's interesting i guess just the the way where you're born what you're raised in and how people react yeah. what um, motivates and, you, right? and yeah like why 
Yeah, yeah. Why are you working? Like, is it for yourself or is it for your family or? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, what's your favorite Vietnamese dish? Oh man, I love Vietnamese food so much. So I think Bum Tit Nung is like one of my favorites just because it is always so consistently good. Like anywhere I go, you could get it and it would just be good, you know? And I, I like those little, the little vermicelli noodles, like the little the boom noodles are just, mm -hmm. they're, I don't know, they're a really nice um, counterpart to the kind of fried stuff or the more heavy kind of meat stuff. And so I just, I love that particular dish. I mean, of course I like banh mi and, um, you know, the, especially when you get it with really good bread and it's a nice late night snack that like you go out drinking and then you stop by somewhere and get like one of these really great sandwiches with the, uh, the pickled vegetables in there that just has like the perfect balance, you know, it's just so, so good and great, like soaks up the booze kind of thing, you know, great. <laughs> um, but I like, I mean, the thing about Vietnam is it's just got such diverse food, right? Like, like I love soup, like I love Asian soups. And, uh, you know, in the South, I get like uh, hu tiu, and it's like, you know, a certain kind of like soup, and then, you know, different from the pho, which is in the North, and different from, you know, all these different other, different kinds of soups. And each one is like a little bit different, but all really flavorful and fun, and, ah, oh, man, it's so good. Uh, if, if, if someone were to ask, if someone that had no idea what uh, bom tit nung is, how would you describe it? Um, well, so it's like the boom part of it is the vermicelli noodles, right? So they're these little thin white noodles that are rice, made from rice, that are kind of like sitting yep. in a little bed or like in a bowl, right? And then tit nung is literally like um, grilled meat, right? And so it's, and it's pork that is uh, grilled and kind of sitting on top of it there. And then usually with some vegetables, and then the quintessential condiment is fish sauce, which, you know, the United States is like, oh, gross, fish sauce, smelly, gross. But, you know, really good, fresh fish sauce, fresh fish sauce. I don't know if that's an oxymoron. Because, <laughs> you know, fish sauce is made by this process where you stack up fish in a big, huge vat and dump salt on it and let it rot for months. And then the stuff that drains out the bottom, you put it in a bottle and put it on the restaurant table. <laughs> But it is delicious, and it is so. And you can, and you can mix it with chilies and make it spicy, and it gives this like salty umami flavor to the food, which is amazing. So you got your noodles, you got your grilled meat, you got your fresh vegetables. You sprinkle a little of the salty um, uh, nook mam uh, fish sauce on it, and it's just like this awesome flavor expo explosion, you know. And it's uh, I don't know. I think of it being a lunchtime thing, but I guess you could have it any time of day. Oh. Yeah. Have you tried making a, a fish, fish sauce at home before? No. Is it something? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, Is it something that? you can do? I didn't know you could make fish sauce. Oh, oh as in the uh, the uh, the fish sauce that comes with boom tit noon, like the, just the, with, uh, like it's just fish sauce, sugar, water, uh, depending on if you want to do vinegar uh, and then lemon. Oh, cool. Um, no, I haven't tried that. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, um, yeah, I love fish sauce, and I think um, I think to try to describe fish sauce uh, as in fish sauce the because so for um, I'm not sure if you notice I I kind of don't notice too when I was in Vietnam um, each dish also will have its accompanying fish sauce of of for that dish meaning the fish sauce often made with uh, bum tit nung um, I'm trying to think it's usually a little bit uh, lighter on saltiness and maybe a little bit sweeter, but as opposed to like fish sauce, if you get a, um, if you get a gun jewel, which is a sweet and sour soup right. and, and you have fish sauce, that fish sauce is probably way more salty. It's made to dip the, the, um, the soup soaked, uh, items to dip it in that fish sauce. So it's a lot more salty. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there's going to be variations even just to people and restaurants, but there are, there is typically, changes to the fish sauce to that dish, whether it be egg rolls, boom, boom, tit nung, gun jewel and whatnot. Right. Um, yeah. So, so, if, uh, typically those are the ingredients, the fish sauce, a lot of sugar, a little bit of water to dilute the fish sauce. Cause it's so strong, a little bit of vinegar or, or, or lemon, mm -hmm. 
um, and then um, chili. Um, yeah, I love fish sauce, man. I drown my bum tet nung in, in, in fish sauce. I mean, almost every every dish um, I at that that comes with fish sauce, I usually drown it with that stuff. Um, and then the other one that you mentioned, oh, um, uh, bun mi. So to describe a bun mi to, uh, I guess, to somebody that's never had a bun yeah. mi before. Yeah, so bun mi is like a sandwich, and it's a, it's, it's pretty cool because it's like a great melding of the uh, kind of traditional Vietnamese food and the kind of colonial history. So you've got like, Vietnam is probably one of the only countries in Asia that I've been in that has good bread. And I guess that's a, a legacy of the French kind of... Yeah, yeah. Oh. That's kind of interesting. Isn't um, isn't Thailand um, isn't bread a big uh, like that's a delicacy there? Isn't I, I'm not sure. I just heard. There's um, there are definitely bread and like kind of bready desserts things. Um, yeah, I guess. Or I'm maybe as well. Um, but huh. maybe it was like an old old traditional thing. Maybe that it used to be a delicacy. Maybe for the price, but nowadays it's cheaper. It could be. I. I you know, Thailand has had an interesting history with a lot of different um, influences from Europe, and they've had kings in the past who have really emphasized that connection. And so I wouldn't be surprised if some of those culinary practices also have been integrated as well. And I'm still learning. That's something that maybe, you know, I'm going to add that to my list to look at uh, <laughs> history. But yeah, the, the banh mi is like, a, a it starts with the bread. The bread is like one of the most important things, right? And uh, I remember this one guy that I was talking to about it said, it's all about the air bread. It's like really light. Yes. Bread, right? And you get yes. it in half. And uh, you add to it a lot of different kinds of things. It depends on what kind of bottom you want. But often it'll be something like um, uh, like, a, like a sausage, like a salami kind of thing. I don't know. But then why? I don't know what it is exactly, but it's like a salami kind of thing. And then pate. Um, and then these pickled vegetables that go in there. So like vegetables that are soaked in vinegar and sugar and stuff. And it, it has this like great like meat, depending on whatever kind of meat you had in there, it can be chicken, it can be pork, it can be uh, uh, fish. Um, and then uh, the, the kind of uh, crispy bread and then the creaminess of the pate and then the kind of vinegar like, um, sourness in there and it's it's again it's just a great snack it's so good we used to have these this lady in virginia that we would go to um they have they have the little uh saigon in um it's the eden center in in virginia um near where we used to live and we go there and they had a lady we just buy a, a bag of these um of these uh banh mi sandwiches there because they were so good and because they're, they're so light um you could just eat eat them like crazy and stuff when I when I was in um, Saigon last year, um, I probably spent I want to say it was like a week's worth of time looking for a bun mi that had. Uh, so I don't I'm not sure if this is Americanized. Uh, I don't know if this is a Vietnamese Americanized thing that I like. It's there's a sweet mayonnaise that they put in the oh, bun yeah, mi. Yeah. I don't, when I was in Vietnam, I couldn't find every, like 90, 95% of the places I went to, um, they didn't add the sweet mayonnaise that I liked. So I tried to describe it to my family and friends over there in Vietnam. I was like, yeah, back in the States, like the Vietnamese shops, they sell these bun mi's and you, I like bun mi tet nung, the, the yeah. grilled pork. And then with that grilled pork, when you get that sweet mayonnaise, uh, when it, when that savory, that savory, uh, grilled pork plus the sweet mayonnaise and all the vegetables and everything, it, it's one of my most favorite dishes. Yes. And so for me to be in Vietnam, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get some really good bun mi. And then I didn't find any that happened to have the, or I, I found, I found very few that had that sweet mayonnaise. Uh, I'm not sure it's mayonnaise or butter. I've tried to actually recreate it at home. I've actually haven't had much luck. I've gone. I, I feel like I've gone close, but I haven't hit this the 
the magical spot yet. Um, so that's kind of something I'm actually curious about. If somebody knows the history of that, um, hopefully somebody watching this, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me let me know where this sweet mayonnaise history or sweet butter comes from. It, it's um, seems yeah, it's like you, you need it, right? Because otherwise it'd be really dry. Like you need to have something to kind of counterbalance all that other stuff happening. Yeah, yeah, no, I I was kind of I guess disappointed when I was in Vietnam. A lot of them sold it without uh, the. I, I think what they tried to do, a lot of them tried to do was they added uh, just soy sauce to to. To get a little bit of that, what um, to get that moisture, I guess, uh, because it's a, it's a, if you're gonna have, well, you get the veggies, but I guess the bread will dry, kind of dry. You get it's a dry dish per se because of the bread, but so then they they add the soy sauce, and that was something I was disappointed where most of them did soy sauce, and uh, I found very few that did the 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 mayonnaise, and it was funny. <laughs> uh, I'm going too much on a tangent. I found one shop that did the, the sweet mayonnaise, but they didn't have the grilled pork. So I literally walked to one place, bought the grilled pork, bun mayonnaise, went to another place, <laughs> took the ingredients and put them in one and then ate it though. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Vietnam, um, amazing food. Um, you mentioned uh, Hu Thieu, what, uh, which, um, there's the dry and the soup uh, version where they, they add the broth in already. How do you how do you like it? And what ingredients do you like? Uh, I like the soup version. Meats. And I, I think the first time I had it was I was on a trip down in the Mekong Delta, and I think it was one of those boat trips. And you know, a lady pulls up on the next to you and makes the, oh, soup man. the boat and gives it to you. And so I kind of had like a very nostalgic kind of feeling. Of Heck yeah! It. I mean, it's the, you know what the cool thing is is that it, the food does not have to come from a fancy restaurant to be delicious, right? Oh, I yeah. think that was kind of like a like a moment for me. Like this is amazing. Like regular people with simple um, ingredients, with you know simple setup, can make delicious food. I mean, I think the best pho I ever had was at the train station in Hanoi. You know, we we're going to go up to Sapa on the overnight train, and we were like looking for some food before we get on this overnight train, and like walk to some random stall, probably only like you know six feet wide or whatever, and this lady's cooking up like the most delicious pho I've ever had. And so it's just, I don't know. I, I love that idea that you just, you don't need much. You just need the, the know-how and some fresh ingredients and you can really just make delicious food. Yeah. I wish America could somehow uh, incorporate that as in, uh, the, in Vietnam, all the food stalls is everywhere. And now I, I understand from a, um, uh, food safety precaution, right. It wouldn't fly here in America, but man, that to have those foods, like, to, like, I mean, even if you scaled up the price to fit America, like in Vietnam, it's kind of unfair because you that Hue dish probably cost you what probably uh, fifteen, probably fifteen thousand, twenty five thousand or something. Right. So that's that's one dollar, some maybe seventy five cents. Yeah. That is, I mean, a meal like that for a dollar, like, oh my goodness, yeah. like this is heaven. Now, even if you scaled it up here in America, say if it was eight eight dollars for a dish like that or ten dollars, like we're missing that here in America. I, I, you can't recreate it because of all the regulations here. But man, yeah. pe pe people that don't know this are missing out. I know, <laughs> and it's sad because like the equivalent of the United States is fast food, right? Like if you want to get yeah, you want to get go to McDonald's, right? But like that's you know it's fat. It has the same kind of speed and price point. But the thing about these options in, in Vietnam or in, in Thailand where I'm at now is like, it's still healthy food. It's still real ingredients. It's still good stuff. You know, it just happens to be cheap and fast. Yeah. Yeah. I actually read a, what I thought was a really smart article um, when they were talking about uh, McDonald's coming to Vietnam and they were saying McDonald's and Burger King and KFC are not pulling in as much revenue as they do in America. And the article goes into saying, well, you have to consider like, say, that food stall that's selling Hugh Thieu, Hugh Thieu, that lady probably woke up at four in the morning to prep that, that, that soup. So you're getting a dish that, that's been stewing and you probably ate it at what, probably 11 a.m. So that's been stewing for seven hours with this meat, this broth, um, and these veggies inside, whether garlic or whatever. And then by the time you get to eat it, this is seven hours in the making. 
you go to McDonald's or something, I mean, it's, it's, that food might have been just, uh, put on the grill like, you know, five minutes ago and it's sitting on a hot plate or whatever and then you get it. So it's super fast, but you don't get that flavor. You don't, you can't do that in a fast food place that the way that these pho, hu thieu, um, even, even bun mi sandwiches, like that would take a lot of, that, that bun mi sandwiches, I feel like if, in a, if you had a Subway try to create bun mi, I, I don't know, it'd be tough. Um, yeah. Even the, have you been to a Lee Sandwiches here in the States? Uh, I don't think so. So Lee Sandwiches is a chain that's, I believe, in Orange County, Texas. They just op they opened about a year or two ago in Las Vegas. Okay. Um, and they do uh, bun mi sandwiches. And they do a decent job. But even then, it almost kind of feels like, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I feel like if, if you told me to go get a good burger and you said McDonald's, I'll tell you, go get a good bun mi and go to Lee Sandwiches, meaning they fast fooded the bun mi thing. It, it's decent, but it's still not bun mi that I like, uh, whether at a, at a nice restaurant or just someplace in Vietnam, a local street vendor. Yeah. Uh, it's still not the same. Um, it's hard. It's really tough to find that balance between getting it quick and getting the right quality. And especially, like you said, these flavors yeah. take a long time to develop. Yeah, yeah. If if you know about pho, that takes uh, like almost a minimum of four hours to 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 get that broth going. So, yeah, people are missing out. <laughs> Go to Vietnam, people. <laughs> um. Oh, all right. Last question. Um. What what habits do you have that improve your life the most? Yeah. Uh. So aside from getting out and traveling and trying new food and trying new things as, as much as possible. I, I think that's, that's probably the most important thing in my life is getting out and trying new things. And I think that um, going and, you know, making that effort to um, not go to the same restaurant, even though I know this restaurant's really good, I'm going to go try the one next to it just in case it's better, you know? And I think that's, uh, it's a little bit drives my wife crazy because you know, <laughs> there's this, actually, there's this book called the, the Paradox of Choice, and it's about um, how people make decisions. And, you know, some people find the thing that they like, and um, they just are happy settling on that thing, because why would you go anywhere else? Because it's like, this is awesome. Like, I don't need anything more. And then there are other people that are, are overwhelmed by the number of things that are out there and the number of choices. And, you know, it can help. It can it can paralyze you a little bit and like understand there's all these choices. But I, I feel like I'm, I, I just, I love the idea of trying something new. And even when I go to the same restaurant, I'm always trying to like figure out what's, what's a new dish I can order off the menu. I know this is like their thing and they're, they're really good at it, but maybe I'll try something else. And I think that's that particular habit of mine of like always wanting to try something new, always wanted to go to a new place. Like I know it drives my wife crazy, but I think that it probably like, it helps contribute to having a really rich life with a lot of new experiences. And some of them are bad. Sometimes it's like, Oh my God, why did I try that? It was horrible. <laughs> sometimes they're good. You know, sometimes it's the best thing ever. And I think it's just, uh, being willing to take that risk and, and having that motivation to try new things has been really, really good for me. Are you as bad as me where like, um, in, I'll take almost 15 minutes, 30 minutes more just to search a new place. <laughs> And it drive it'll drive people crazy. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Come on, this thing's right down the street. We don't need to go and like. Oh no, but look, look, like maybe there's something around the corner. <laughs> I have to say that I'm not very good at doing my research. So that I, you know, I rely on my wife to do all the research and find all the the great places and the great options. And then, you know, my my preference is always to try with whatever the option is that we haven't done yet. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, this was this was awesome, man. We'll have to do this again. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, actually. It's kind of neat to just have the flexibility to talk at length about things and just have it, like you said, be a free-flowing conversation. Mm -hmm.